In this video, you'll learn how to set up your coding environment that we'll be using for this course. Now we're going to be using CodePen, which is an online text editor. You can see you have your HTML, your CSS, and your JavaScript section. For this course, we will not be using the JavaScript. For later courses, we will be. Now CodePen is an amazing tool to use for development because you can create things on the fly. Instead of having to switch from Sublime, your text editor, to your browser and refreshing, which takes time. So I can show you an example of that right now. Let's go to new pen, and we'll make our infamous hello world. Hello world. And there you go, we made our first web page in less than five seconds. So what I'm gonna do now is get you set up on CodePen. So I'm gonna open a Safari, because my information is not saved on this browser, so just go to CodePen. Just sign up. Then at the bottom, there'll be a free option. And then you'll just enter your information or use your GitHub account, which I use my GitHub account. And then once you're set up, you'll have something like this. And that's it. So in this video, you set up your coding environment. Now we can just jump into making websites right away. So let's do it. In this video, you will learn what HTML is and how it differs from other programming languages. So HTML is the content of your web page. If you have a blog, the HTML is the words and headings of your blog post. It's the paragraphs. It is the actual what on your web page. HTML is not the style. CSS is the style. So as HTML is the what, CSS is the how. And let's take a, an example look at what I'm talking about. Let's go to CNN.com. Here you can see the web page when it has both HTML and CSS working together as, and JavaScript, but mostly CSS and HTML. So I'm using Google dev tools right now. I just right click and I press inspect element. Here you can see all of the HTML and here is all the CSS. So what we're going to do now is see what this web page looks like without any CSS. So we're going to go to the head section. We're going to find the links to the CSS. We're going to delete them. So here's one, two, three. And here you can see the web page without any CSS. As I said earlier, this HTML is the what of the web page. Here you can see we have links, text, and some images, and it's all very ugly. So let's look back at the HTML. Here you can see it looks like a bunch of gibberish, which by the end of the course you will understand and be able to change on the fly. But right now, I'll cut this down for you. You have the opening tag, then you have a closing tag. See, you have an opening section and a closing section. See, HTML is a markup language that uses tags. These tags are like Tupperware containers that you store different kinds of food in. So one container will have just oatmeal in it and another container will have meat or rice. So in this video, you learned that HTML is the actual content of the web page, such as headings and paragraphs. You also saw that HTML is a markup language and what that actually means. So you have an opening tag and a closing tag that contains some content that displays to the web page. Now in the next video, you will learn more about HTML tags and how to structure them properly. In this video, you'll dissect the structure of a web page to understand what goes on in each section and how to properly nest your tags. So as I described in the last video, HTML is made up of nested tags. That means you start with the most general tag and then nest the tag to become more specific. As I described that, a tag is like a Tupperware container that contains different kinds of food. Like for one container, you'll have your oatmeal, and then another container, you have your fish or rice. So let's look at some more examples to better understand what I'm saying here. So here we have a car. The most general tag is the car. And as we become more nested, it becomes more specific of what is in the car. So in the car has an engine, which in the engine has a transmission and a radiator. Also in the car, but not in the engine, is a stereo, which has a CD player and an FM radio. Let's take another look at an example. 
for all you football fans. So on a football team, you have a team, which has a defense and an offense. In the defense, you have defensive backs, and then you have the names. And same with the offense, you have the wide receivers and the wide receivers' names. Now let's see how this translates over to HTML. So you have your HTML tag, which contains everything in the web page itself, because a web page is HTML. So in that, you have your head tag, which is everything that is not displayed to the user. And then you have your body tag, which is all of your content that is displayed to your user. I'm going to clean that up a little bit. So in your head tag, you'll have things like your title tag, which the title displays up here on the browser in the tab. So in this example, I'm going to make it about cars. I will spell it right, cars. And then we'll say you have your meta, meta description, meta name equals description. I'll show you what this is. And then the content will say, I love cars. Now what a meta name or what a meta description is, is when you search for cars, it is the text that shows up here in the search result. So it doesn't show up on a web page, but crawlers like Google, Bing, and Yahoo will scrape this and then it will show up in their search results. So it's still important information to have. So this web page is about cars. So we want to display this to our users using an H1 tag. So now our user can see that this page is about cars. And then of course we'll have some content about cars because that's what the web page is about. So in the body tag, you'll also have your lists, you'll have images and more text and some subheadings, some H2s. And this will all be displayed for our user to see. Well, everything in the head section is for, you know, robots and crawlers, which our user will not see, but this is still important to have. So in this video, you learned how to properly nest your tags and how to structure your web page using the HTML head and body tags. In the next video, you'll start making your very first web page that is a blog post about your favorite cakes. In this video, you'll make your first blog post, which will be about your favorite cakes. And the first step is to create a title, which will display in the tab in the browser. So as I said, this blog post is about your favorite cakes. So it only makes sense to make the title my favorite cakes. And it won't display here in CodePen, but if you had a website, it would display here. So now let's actually make some content that will display to our user. So the H1 tag describes what is on this page. What is this page about? So again, it only makes sense to put my favorite cakes. Yep. So then we go more specific, just like nesting our tags. We will have an H2 tag, which is a subheading. So we have my favorite cakes. So now let's start talking about what your favorite cakes actually are. So one of my favorite cakes is German chocolate. So let's put that in an H2 tag. And then under that, we would have some actual content of how much I love German chocolate cake. Let me tell you, oh, I love German chocolate cake. But German chocolate cake is not my only love. I also love red velvet cake. I do not get that very often. So I really love, I really love this cake. So now let's show an example of all the headings you have available to you. Now H1 is the most relevant thing on the page. And then H6 is the least relevant. And you can also see that they'll decrease in size as you go. So this is an H3. Here's an H4, H5, and H6. As you can see, H1 is biggest, H2 second biggest, and all the way down to H6. 
Now you're probably wondering, what will I actually use an H6 for? So I'll show you. So usually you'll just use it for the site map at the bottom. These are all H6s. They're not really relevant to the actual page, but they are relevant to the website. So that's why you would put that in an H6 rather than just plain text. So in this video, you set up your first blog post and you use headings to properly structure the content on your web page. In the next video, you'll incorporate two lists into your cake blog post. In this video, you'll add an ordered and unordered list to your cake blog post. Now lists are an important factor in usability because it helps users find what they're looking for quickly. Internet users don't read web pages like they read books. They skim. It's like looking at a billboard. The bullets or numbers help them skim and find things they're looking for faster. And that's why lists are important. It helps them find the information they're looking for faster so they don't go to that back button and leave your web page. So we're optimizing for users through lists. So what we're going to do here is we still have our favorite cakes. So let's add an H2. Let's see, best cakes. Now let's make, let's make an ordered list. So let's have our top three cakes. So our first cake, as I said, German chocolate. Yes. Now our next one is red velvet. And our third one will be, how about ice cream? Ice cream cake, so good. Had that for my birthday last year. So now when our user looks at the web page, it can easily find what are the best cakes. Number one, German chocolate, two, red velvet, three, ice cream. Simple. So now let's make another list for cities I've had cake. And this will be an unordered list because order doesn't matter here. In the first list, we were listing our top three cakes where order matters because ice cream cake is not better than German chocolate cake. But here we're listing cities we've had cakes and the order doesn't matter. So let's say Houston, Austin, and New York City. All great places, but order doesn't matter here. So in this video, you learned how to implement ordered and unordered lists for your cake blog post. You learned that using lists frequently on your web page is an important factor in making your content easier for users to find. Now in the next video, you'll put everything you learned so far together for your first coding challenge, where you'll build a web page about the dream cars that you'll own someday. Here's your first coding challenge. Create a new pin and make a web page with the title My Dream Cars. Make an H1 tag that says Cars I Will Own Someday. Then make an ordered list of your dream cars with a corresponding H2 heading. Then make an unordered list of the add-ons that you want for your cars with a corresponding H2 heading. Well, here's a screenshot of what your output should look like. Now what I want you to do is once you're finished, save your pin and share the link to the pin to the discussion group in the sidebar. Now if you get stuck, look back at the previous videos. Do not look at the next video until you've finished this challenge. Because in the next video, we're going to walk through how I did this. All right, you finished your first coding challenge. Congratulations. Let's do a walkthrough. So first, you created your HTML tag. And I want to note real quick that best practice is to close your tag right after you create it. Let me tell you that will eliminate a lot of problems down the road when you forget to close your tag and then you can't find where your error is and you have to sift through thousands of lines of code just to find the one missing tag. So save yourself a headache, close your tag right after you open it. So then you created your head tag, and you created your body tag. Now the first step was to create a title that says My Dream Cars. So My Dream Cars. 
Good. Now we go to the body tag. The next step is to create an H1 that says cars I will own someday. Cool. So now we're going to list those cars by first giving it an H2, my cars. So now we're going to make an ordered list of the cars that I want. So the first car that I want is a Ferrari. Second car, let's be environmental here. Let's have a Prius. <laughs> and then for our third car, the Batmobile. Batmobile, na 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 Batman. Hey, you know you wish for it too. So here's my first choice, second choice, third choice. I mean, why not all of them, right? So now the, the next step is to create the add-ons that I want for my cars. So let's say car add-ons. And this is an unordered list. So one add-on that I want is nitrous oxide. You know that boost stuff that makes you go super fast like they have in Fast and Furious? Oh yeah. Now, I need a remote start so I can warm my car up when it's cold outside. And then for the last one, I want a seat ejector with built-in jetpack. <laughs> because why not? So there you go. Your first coding challenge is done. I'm going to post this pin in the download section so you can go to it, mess around with the code if you want, or save it. So good job, you now understand what HTML is and the structure it uses. You also understand how to use headings in both ordered and unordered lists to structure your web page to make your content easy for your users to skim and find what they're looking for. You've really come a long way in a very short time. In the next video, you're going to learn how to use inline tags to bring your paragraphs to life. First code challenge complete. Now in this video, you're going to learn how to use inline tags to bring your paragraphs to life. Here's a few examples of inline tags. We have the strong, the emphasis, and the span tag. Now, the reason these are called inline is because you can use them in a line. So, let's give an example of that. Let's open a new pin. Let's create a paragraph. This is a cool example. So an inline tag is a tag that can go inside of this paragraph, hence in a line. So let's give cool emphasis. And here you can see that cool has now been given emphasis. Now let's look at what a span is. New example. New example of a span. So what a span does is it's a, think of it as a highlighter. So you can highlight the span of something or a span of text. Think of it that way. And then I can say I'll give this uh, a class of I want this to be you know bold. So then I go down to CSS for what we'll do later and say class bold has font weight. Let's just make a color. That's easier for you to see red. There you go. It allows you to manipulate text within a line any way you want. And you can find a list of more inline tags that you can use by clicking on the link in the downloads tab to the right. So in this video, you learn what inline tags are and how to use them to give your text more life by changing the color, by giving it emphasis, by strong, and a whole list of other tags that you can use. In the next video, you will learn about void tags and how they differ from regular HTML tags. In this video, you'll learn the difference between void tags and other HTML tags you've learned so far. Void tags 
don't need a closing tag like regular HTML tags. Here's an example of a void tag. As you can see, it's like opening the tag, but then you close it within the same tag. A void tag doesn't need input. It doesn't contain anything like a regular HTML tag does. So let's show an example of this. Clear this. So a regular HTML tag, as I've taught you so far, let's take paragraph example, is you have an opening tag here and then a closing tag. And then it contains some kind of things. Remember I said that tags are like Tupperware containers that contain different kinds of food. So inside this paragraph tag, you'll have some text. Now void tags are different because they don't contain anything. So an image is one example. Now, in order for an image to actually display, an image tag has attributes that you can use, which we're going to look more at in the next video. But just to give a short example, it'll go like this. And then you put in the URL of, let's just look for an image real quick. Let's say robots. Oops, let's find an image. Copy image URL. So this is not an actual input. It's an attribute. Make it to where you can see this better, since the link is so incredibly long. So here you can see the difference between a regular HTML tag that contains some content and a void tag that doesn't take anything, but it uses attributes. Let's make another example to make this more clear, and I'll just delete everything. So let's have some more text. And here is a line break void tag. You see how it created a line right here? That's a line break. And it's a void tag because it doesn't have any inputs. And that's the difference between a regular HTML tag and a void tag. And here, there's a list of more void tags in the download section to the right. So just check that out and you can see everything you have available to you. So in the next video, we're going to go over more about HTML attributes like you just saw in that image tag and how to incorporate them into our tag repertoire. In this video, I'm going to teach you more about HTML attributes and how to incorporate them into HTML tags that you already know and have been using. Now, HTML attributes provide additional metadata for HTML tags to use and display. The example that I used in the last video was the image tag, which I used a source attribute to give this image tag a URL of an image to display. Now, since I already used that example, Let's use a different example. Let's create a link using the a tag and the href attribute. Now with the href attribute, it gives a link, a URL to go to. So let's send this link to google.com. And in between the a tags, we'll give the anchor text Google. So here you see our link. It has the text Google, and then when we click on it, it goes to google.com. Now the reason that I did a right click and open in a new tab is because if I clicked on this now, it will send my current web page to Google, and I don't want to do that. So we can use another HTML attribute to get around that, and that's called target. Let me give that a value of equals underscore blank. So now when I click on this, it opens in a new tab, which this is great if you want your website to stay open when a user clicks on a different link. So in this video, you learn more about HTML attributes and how to incorporate them into existing HTML tags that you already know and have been using. Now in the next video, I'm going to teach you all about HTML classes and how to use them to organize your HTML. In this video, you will learn how to group your HTML using HTML classes. Now there are three primary reasons for grouping your tags together. The first reason that it helps make sense to somebody who has seen your code for the first time so that they can actually understand what your code is and where everything is. The second reason is to help yourself know where everything is after you've taken a couple months off and you haven't seen the code in a while. And the third reason 
is to make it easier to make multiple changes in your code at the same time so that you don't have to go through every single thing in an individual fashion and change it by hand. This means faster production time, which is what we want. I mean, that's the entire reason we're using CodePen, remember? So let's go to HTML classes now and show you what that means. So here is an HTML class, which we call picture group. And inside of that contains our pictures. So now when somebody sees this code for the first time, the first they'll see, oh, here's some images. And then they're in the picture group. Makes sense, right? So another example would be if you have a blog post, then you want to group all of the blog content together in one class. And then you'll group all the headings together in one class. So let's make an example of that real quick to show you what I mean. So let's say here we have um, a blog post about airlines. So how about we have Delta here. And we're going to give this a class of blog header. And the naming convention for HTML and CSS is to use a hyphen between the name, between the words. So then we'll have some content. Delta is pretty good in my experience. Now since this is the blog content, we're going to give this a class of blog content. So here we have one blog post, which is extremely small, but still blog post. Now let's create another blog post. I got to close my tag. And another airline, say United. Let's have our blog content say, I don't know because I haven't flown with United. So now when somebody looks at your blog, they can tell that Delta is the blog header and that Delta is pretty good in my experience, is the blog content. So you can see off the bat that it is easy to understand. Now, I'll show you how we can change things on the fly and how much easier classes make things to change. So let's change the blog content to be a different font family. So let's take the blog content and font family, let's make this Tahoma. Here you can see that both of the blog content sections changed at the same time. Now if we weren't using classes, then I would have to do this by hand manually by using a span or something else. But this, this is proper practice. This is best practice and this is the way that is easiest in the way that you want to use. And one last note on creating class names, you want to make it as specific as possible. Because if you haven't looked at the code in months and you make your name ambiguous, like instead of blog content, say blog stuff, you're not going to know what that means. When somebody else looks at that code, they're not going to know what it means either. So make it specific. So in this video, you learned how to use HTML classes to group and organize your HTML content to make things easier to find for somebody else, to make it easier to find for yourself, and to make it to where you can edit and change things on the fly super easy and super fast, which is what we are all about in this course. In the next video, you're going to take your HTML grouping to another level with HTML IDs. In this video, you're going to continue to build off of our idea of grouping in HTML by using HTML IDs. Now, IDs differ from classes because IDs are unique and they should only be used as a last resource. Classes are used in multiple places on your web page, just as we can see here on an example. So we have blog header used here and here, and our blog content used here and here. But an ID will only be used in one place. So let's use an example. So let's give this blog content an ID 
of blog post one. Let's get this blog post an ID of blog post two. So now if I want to change blog post one, but not blog post two, then I will select the ID for blog post one and make those changes. So let's do that. Let's select blog post one, and make some changes. I want the color to be blue. And let's make it a different color so it's easier for you to see. There you go, red. So here you can see that the changes occurred to blog post one, but not blog post two. And this is the power of IDs. It's specificity at its finest. But you don't want to use it too often. Don't try to use an ID for what you can use a class for. And that's what I see a lot of beginners make that mistake, is they'll try to use IDs as classes. Only use an ID in one place on the web page. Never use an ID more than once. So in this video, you learned how to use IDs to change one thing and nothing else. In the next video, you're going to take your first quiz. It's going to be fun. Good luck. All right. In this video, you'll continue to learn more about the image tag and how to use it to place images on your web page. So we went over before in the void tag lecture about images. And you know that images use attributes. They don't have input. It's a void tag. So we're going to go over the two main uh, attributes in this video. So let's do the first one, which you already saw, which is source. And always remember to close your tag when you open it. So let's just find a, an image. Let's just find an image, take the URL, and then display it. And there's our teddy bear. And so, okay, let's say that we have this we have this teddy bear on our web page, and it's about teddy bears. And we want Google to know, or any other search engine or scraper, we want them to know that our website is about teddy bears. So there's a specific tag for that, since, since search engines and scrapers and uh, spiders is the same thing as a scraper. They can't actually see the image. You have to tell the spider what the image is. So that's where the alt tag comes in. So you would just say, say this is a teddy bear product. So teddy bear for children. <clears throat> so then what that's useful for is if I go to teddy bear for children in Google, then see, this is perfect. This is a perfect example. And this is what I do for my clients. I use the image alt tab uh, attribute to get them to show up in this image results. And sometimes um, Google will have the images up here at the very top which is like number one click-through for all searches is at the very top. Sometimes it'll be down here. It just depends on how Google changes their, you know, how they show their results, it changes. And it'll also show up here in Google Images. So if, you know, a uh, potential customer is looking for, you know, a teddy bear they want, they'll just look through the images, maybe. I mean, it's always a possibility. But this is the number one spot you want to get seen in Google. So that's why the alt attribute is very, very, very handy because it can't see images. You have to tell it what it is. And then you show up for those specific keywords. And then, let's see. Um, there's, I want to show you how to you know, change the size, but off the top of my head, I don't remember. So let's look for it. You're going to have to learn how to look up documentation anyway. So how to change the size of HTML. This is something you're going to have to do. You're going to always have to look at documentation. And any good programmer knows to look at documentation. So let's use this. And that just made it incredibly small. So then let's make this, you know, 200 pixels. Uh, 420 pixels and it's very blurry but you get the idea of how to change the size of an image and I will add that 
if you go to, let's see, a speed site, right? Um, the faster your website is, the better you rank in search engines. So the importance of actually having the height and width set either through hard coding it in an HTML image like this or using CSS like I'll show you later, you give it a certain class which will display um, the image in a particular size. So that's useful if you have like an e-commerce store and you have a bunch of images uh, laid after one another. Like, let me, let me give you an example. Amazon is just the best example. So you see how all these shoes are about the same uh, width and height. So each one of these shoes, images, they all probably have the same class that gives them the same width and height. So we can even see this right here. See, product image, width auto, height auto, max width is 270, max height is 200. See, that's exactly what I'm talking about. And that is going to be absolutely essential later when we do CSS. Otherwise, you would have to hard code, copy and paste this at every single image. And we are programmers. We don't want to do that. We're lazy. So there are a lot more attributes for the image tag. And you can see them over in the downloads tab to the right. And in the next video, you'll learn how to turn your image into a link. In this video, you're going to learn how to create links for your web page. Now, links are the meat and potatoes of your web page because it's how a visitor will get from one site to another. So I'll give an example. You're going to use the a tag with an href attribute, and we're just going to set it to Google. And you have to make sure that you give it the proper address or else you will get an error. Actually, it won't give you an error. It just won't work. So here it is, and we're going to open it, and it gives us to Google. Now you can use the target, target attribute. See, I click on this and it opens it in the new tab. So why that's good is because it leaves the original web page open. So the user doesn't have to go through a million, you know, backspaces to try to find your website because you want to make it as easy as possible for your user to use your website. I mean, as obvious as that sounds, it will keep your user there and also by having this web page active for a longer time that activity will rank you higher in google or any other search engines now here's a good example of inner links so this was an outer link right i linked to something outside of my website that's an outgoing link but ingoing links or um inbound links no interlinks are just as important so the perfect example for that is wikipedia so let's go to polar bears just first thing i think of and you see all of these links right so if i click on um sea ice then it takes me to the web page that is still part of wikipedia but it's sea ice and see this is anchor text still like Arctic Ocean is anchor text. And you see what I could do with a target blank if we click on this, then it would have kept the polar bear open. So then I could go back and reference the polar bear web page instead of having to press the back button like I had to do. So these interlinks are also important to have on your website. You will want to have, you know, you don't want to have a lot. Um, I mean, this is Wikipedia. If this wasn't Wikipedia, this would be a total overkill of interlinks. You'd probably want to have one or two. And the reason that's important, it tells uh, search engines and scrapers what your content is mainly about. Like the entirety of your website will be shown in your anchor text. And then that gives Google or any other search engine a good idea of what your website is about. And it will rank you for those things. I mean, that's not also including, you know, like the, um, that's not including the navigation, just purely in the text, just one or two interlinks. But it's always good to have, you know, good navigation and stuff on top. And, you know, we'll, we'll go over that later in the projects. So as I said in the last, in the last lecture, how to make your image a link. So what you would do here for your input is you would put an image. So what's a good, Image for, let's just see what happens when I Google Google. 
<laughs> find an image. Let's do a doodle for Google. Take that image, and boom. There's my image, even though I didn't close it. Broke my own rule, I didn't close my tag whenever I opened it. For shame, for shame. But now you can see when I click on this, it goes to Google, and the target blank attribute is still active. So now you know how to create links to the rest of your web page and to outgoing web pages as well. And in the next video, where you're going to dive in to your second coding challenge. Look forward to it. Code challenge number two. The first step is to make an ordered list of your four favorite kinds of food. Step two is to give the first item a strong. So make that text strong. Step three is to give the second item on the list emphasis. Step four is to give the third item on the list red text using a span tag. Step five is to give the fourth item on the list, make it an image instead of text. So here you can see I used a picture of yogurt. And if you want extra points, take a picture of some of your food using, you know, you can take a picture and upload it to Dropbox, or you can take it and upload it to Instagram or any other kind of website, and then use that URL to display your image. And then of course, if you do this, Share it in the discussion section to the right so we can all see the awesome chef that you are or the awesome food that you, get, uh, you got to eat. <laughs> and then step six is to give each element in the list an ID of its own name. So in this example, uh, my first item is Pad Thai. I would give it an item or an ID of Pad Thai. And then the second one, I would give an ID of pizza, etc. And then step seven is to give um, group all of the food items that are text so item one through three, and give them a class of food list. And be sure to use the correct casing for HTML class. So remember, it's hyphen, lowercase and hyphen. And once you're done, feel free to share the pin in the discussion section. And one thing that you learned in this challenge that you found the most useful and helpful. And in the next video, I'll walk you through how I completed this challenge. Let's go over how to complete code challenge number two. The first thing you're going to do is create your HTML section. And for good practice, we're going to create a head section, even though we're not going to use it, and then a body section. Okay. So the first step is to make an ordered list of your four favorite kinds of food. So let's create an ordered list. Uh, the first one will be, at least for me, it'll be, let's be more specific, pad thai. Yes. The second one, pizza. Fourth one, miso soup. I mean the fourth, that's the third, excuse me. And the fourth one, I love me some yogurt. My fingers are just all over the place. <laughs> okay. All right, step two, make the first item strong. All right, let's do that. There you go. Step three, give the second one emphasis. Okay. Use the EM tag, give it some emphasis. All right. Step four, give the third item red text using the span tag. Okay, so I didn't go over how to use a span tag and you're encouraged to use Stack Overflow, Google, or any kind of documentation to just figure out how to do this. I'll show how I do it using some CSS. So, so we have our span tag there. I created a CSS class. Here we're going to modify the class, give it a color of red. There you go. Step, what step was that? Step four complete. There you go. All right, step five, for the fourth item, use an image instead of text. So there are a lot of girls on Instagram who love to take pictures of their food, and I happen to find a very nice one for yogurt that I'm going to use. 
or the stem. Oops, I forgot to actually create the image tag. Oops. There you go. Perfect. It's beautiful. It's so beautiful. I want to eat it. All right, step six. Give each element in the list an ID of its own name. So let's do that. ID. ID. <laughs> Pad Thai. ID. What is it? Pizza. Pizza. And then ID. Miso soup. And then ID. Yogurt. Cool. All right, the last step is group all the food items that are text and give it a class of food list. So I like to put the class first. That's just how I'm used to doing it. So when I scan down a bunch of code, I'll see the class first and the ID second. It's just easier for me to read. It's good to be consistent because then it's easier to find things. So there you have it. Code challenge number two complete. So once you're done, you know, share the pin in the discussion section on the right. And one thing that you learned in this challenge that you found, you know, really helpful. In the next video, we are going to go over how to create forms in HTML. In this video, you're going to learn how to use forms on your web pages to capture, you know, leads for your email list or to give your users a place to log in or to get data that you need for your app. Like if you have a, a uh, weather app, for example, you go to weather.com and it gives a simple form right here to put your zip code. Then you give it that and then it sends that information to whatever handles that data. But the forms are the way to get that data and that's what we're going to learn. So first we open with the form tag All right, and then we're going to add our inputs. So our first input, let's say that we're going to capture a first and last name for our email list, right? We have, um, we're trying to sell a product that has to do with you know, getting better at basketball. So we want people's first and last name, and of course their email. So input type equals text. Oh, and you need to make that, yes. And then the attribute name, it's going to be F name, so first name for the name attribute. Also, we're going to add a placeholder. We're going to use the placeholder attribute, and let's, there you go. We're going to say, enter, It's probably going to be too long. Nope, it's not. All right, let me close the tag. Oh wait, you don't need to close that like that. Actually, yeah, it's a void tag. So it's just good practice to put that uh, little slash in there. All right, so then we're going to have another one for the last name, and then another one for the email. And we don't want that. We want them to be stacked. So we're going to do one. A break. Line break. Oops. All right. This looks better. Uh, if we had CSS, we would make this look a lot better. And if we wanted this to look a lot better, we would use Bootstrap. Which um, we're going to do that for our yeah third coding challenge. I'll show you. We're going to use Bootstrap to make you know our forms look a lot better. So we're going to change this to L name for last name, and enter your last name. And this is going to be email. So enter your email here. And then of course we need a button to submit the data. So then input type equals submit. So it gives us submit to the type attribute. We're going to give that a value of, well, first we need to fix this because it looks terrible. So 
the value of what happened. Yeah, I thought it said submit. What happened? Oh, I don't know. Okay, so there we go. And we can put my name in. Say Michael. Um, email. Hello, Melanator. Whatever you get the idea. So. You learned how to use uh, forms, how to create your form for your website. And in the next video, we are going to create tables in HTML. In this video, you'll learn how to make tables in HTML. In the previous video, you learned how to get data from a user using forms. While forms are a good way of getting data from a user, tables are a good way of displaying that data after you've done calculation with them or just wanting to organize it. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a table containing data of our two friends, or at least my two friends. It's going to contain the name, the age, and the email of those friends. So first, let's create the table. And then, then we have a table header, which first we're going to use. Okay, so you have table rows, table headers, table data, and there are uh, more, and I will put it in the resources tab, the download section to the right, for you to check out, as well as all the attributes that go with table, table row, table data, etc. So you can check those out. But this is just a simple example, just so you can see what tables are and how to make a basic one. So the first one, we're going to have our table header, which the first one is name. And let's make this easier. Let's just copy and paste this. Oops. Copy and paste. That didn't close this. So name, age, and what did I say? Email. Yeah. So you can see I'm showing up here, and since we can't really tell that this is a table, we're going to put a border around it. So look at our amazingly ugly <laughs> table. See, I would never make a table without Bootstrap, just because it looks like it's 1990 all over again. <laughs> so let's make another table row, which is going to contain the information. And let's just go ahead and copy and paste this, since we're going to have uh, two rows, one for each person. So then we're going to have table data, which is going to be the name, age, and email of each person. So copy, paste. One, two, and one, two, three. Okay, so the first person's name is Jeff. He is 35, and Jeff's email is, I don't know Jeff's email, so let's say Jeff at gmail.com. <laughs> All right, second person, second friend is Courtney. She is 25, and her email is, um, what is it, mcmac at uf.edu. Something like that. So there you have it. Uh, there's our awesome table. Like I said, I would never do this without Bootstrap. I'm going to show you real quick. We're going to do this in the next coding challenge. But just to give you a little taste of what uh, they look like, they look so much cleaner. Look how much cleaner this looks than that. So this is why I just I wouldn't do it. And they're responsive too. See. It's responsive, and let's see how do I make this. Oops, I'm trying to make this full screen. I don't remember, but it's not. Either way, it's not responsive. So we're gonna use Bootstrap later on. So now you know how to display data to your users in the form of a table, which makes the data easier to skim for the user. So of course, if they're looking for data, they see a table, and they'll easily find it. Looking for the name. Boom, it's like a database. It's easy to find the information you're looking for. Now, in the next video, we're going to go over semantic tags, which will include some HTML5. And we're going to use these to better organize our web page, both for our convenience and for the search engines that will scrape or crawl our websites. All right, so in this video, we're going to cover semantic tags, which is HTML5. Now we're just going to skim the surface because HTML5 and CSS3, they're just books, long books, written on the subjects. 
So we're just going to go over how to use basic semantic tags to help us organize our website. Almost every single modern web browser supports HTML5 and CSS3 now. Chrome supports it across the board. So does Firefox. Those are the main browsers use um, an IE10, but I'm not a big IE fan, but you know, it'll get there. It's 2015. And uh, just while we're here, the nifty thing on this site, and I'll post the link to it in the download section, is if you see we have media query, uh, queries, if we click on this, it takes you to some documentation about what media queries are and how to implement them. So it's a good reference to have if you want to go into learning more about HTML5 you know, on your own or with uh, one of my next courses or someone else's course on HTML5. So let's show you an example. We can kind of tie back to the cakes uh, blog that we had. So here first is a boilerplate that we can just copy and paste. Now boilerplate is just all the code needed for this. You just copy and paste it. I mean you can do the same thing for Bootstrap or a lot of other things. If you're doing like Angular, JS, or just any kind of JS library, there are tons of boilerplates. That's for any kind of code really. So here we have Hello World. I'm going to get rid of this. And you'll see the difference, like the document type up here has changed. Um, you have, oops, you have if IE, it takes a certain JavaScript library in to handle it because Internet Explorer is slow and, you know, getting with the times. And then you have some CSS here that you don't really need, but, I mean, just please don't, don't ever put your CSS here. Always have your CSS in an external file. Don't ever put it in the same, don't ever put it in the same file as your HTML. We'll just leave that there for reference. So say we had our blog post about, you know, cakes. So we'll have article, we'll use the article tag. And this also lets search engines know that this is an article. And the article has different attributes. And I'm pretty sure author is one of them, which you can then link back to your Google Plus account. And I use this a lot for my clients whenever they're writing or whenever they have blog posts or I write blog posts for them. That way, Google will associate their Google Plus account with their website. And then that helps them show up better in the search ranks because it gives them more credibility since you've established that authorship. So uh, let's just have a H1. This is a simple, simple cakes. And then we'll have some text about cakes. And that's it for this example. So you just see we have article. So instead of using a div class equals, you know, what was it, uh, blog post, we just use article. Now, of course, we could give this article a class of its own, say, um, let's use simple recipes or whatever. If I can spell it, I can spell it, I believe it. And then we can, you know, style that however we want. Or we can use, you know, add a footer. And just, this is navigation. And, you know, you'll see this in Bootstrap too, because Bootstrap does use HTML5. You'll see at the top, it'll have nav. Like, so we'll just say, um, just leave this blank, because I don't have an actual URL. Let's just say home. It's not going to go anywhere, because it's a blank URL. And of course, we got to close the nav tag. This is footer nav. So now you can see the power of semantic tags because now you know where everything is. It's, in my opinion, like I said, it's easier to look at. I can look at the nav and I know that this is navigation. I can look at this article and I know that it's a blog post or article. I can look at the footer and I know it's, it's navigation footer. Instead of seeing div class equals, then look at that. I just like it better. I think it's easier to style, it's easier to work with. And if somebody else, and this is the most important, too. If you're working on a big website with more than one person, I think that's, that's I think that this is absolutely crucial because it just makes the code more obvious of what it is.
instead of using arbitrary classes. Because not everybody thinks the same thing. Like I could name this article simple recipes and then another person can uh, look at that and say, well, I don't know what this is. And then they'll style it a different way and then you'll conflict on ideas and it's just, it's just better to have semantic tags. <laughs> So now you know how to incorporate semantic tags into your web page to organize it better. And in the next video, you'll have your third coding challenge where you'll create a form to get a user's email and then get them to sign up for your mailing list by displaying the benefits of hiring you. And you'll show that through a table. Code challenge number three. Let's do this. So your assignment is First, imagine that you are a web developer, which by this point, you are a web developer. So now you're looking for clients and you have a blog about web dev and how to bring you know, more customers to online businesses. So you are opting in potential customers here. You wanna get their email and you want them to submit their email. And under that, you're gonna have a three by three table or a bigger table if you want, explaining you know, the benefits of working with you and as a bonus, use Bootstrap to make your tables and forms. And we will go over this in the next video. So I'll see you there. And don't forget, when you're finished with this challenge, post a link to your code pin in the discussion section. And I'll check it out. Code challenge number three. Let's do this. Okay, so the task is to create a form that takes input from a user. We're gonna get their email. And under that, we're gonna create a table that tells the benefits of hiring us for a web development job. So I'm going to use Bootstrap for this because Bootstrap makes tables and forms look beautiful. And if a potential client sees an ugly looking form, they are definitely not going to hire us for a web dev job. So we're going to get Bootstrap getting started. We're going to go down to the boilerplate code, copy and paste it. And you can see, um, since this is code pin, we don't need this doc type. It'll automatically, maybe that's for HTML5, but for code pin, it has handy things behind the scenes that make it to where we don't need that. So now we need to get the, the CDN for the CSS files. So normally here we would have we would have our bootstrap CSS file in the folder with the HTML. But since this is code pin, we need to use a CDN. So what a CDN is, if you don't know, it is a so you can see that it changed. So the CSS has been applied. But a CDN is a content delivery network, which is like having a library online and you're accessing that library to send the library back. So instead of having the CSS file in your folder with the HTML, you are getting it from an external library, but it's like it's in your folder. So, you know, I put some more stuff in the resources about CDNs for you to read up on. All right, so now we have that. So now let's make our form. So bootstrap form. And again, we're just going to Copy and paste, which is so much better. Okay, so normally I would fix this with CSS, but since we're not in the CSS yet, um, we'll just leave it as, oh, it just looks so terrible though. But that's fine. So we don't need the password. We do not need the file input or the checkbox. So let's get rid of that. We do need the button. And so we have the email address and the placeholder email. So let's change the placeholder to type your email here. And then we have the submit button. I don't like this submit button. So let's find our buttons and let's change it. So I wanted to 
stick out. I want it to have the success color. So let's see, button, button success. So we add that class. Let's just do button success. It should turn green. And there we go. Our button is now green. I want to make it large too. It's not big enough. So let's go to the docs. Sizes, button large. So button, button large. Nope, it's LG. There we go. My button is large now. Cool. All right, it's a three by three table, which means we're going to have one row for companies we've worked with. I mean, one column for companies we've worked with. Another column for what they have to say for us, what they have to say about us, like testimonials. And then the third column is the benefits of working with us or working with you. So first, we'll make our first table row. So we're going to have four table rows. So might as well just copy and paste them now. Two, three, four. Then we're going to have three table headers. Two, three. Okay, so let's do this first. And we are going to add a line break. All of my indentions are off and it's going to drive me crazy. Okay. Okay, so the first header is companies I've worked with. Okay. Testimonials. And then methods. Cool. Let's just do this for now. Just for now, and we'll go back to Bootstrap and make it look better. All right, so now let's start filling this table in with table data. We're going to need three of these. Okay, so companies I've worked with, let's be optimistic here and say Google. Oops. Of course, Google. Amazon. And then Fred Septic. Oh, and you can see here that I've goofed putting these. Oh, silly, silly, silly me. You see, the mistake I've made is I put them in the same row when they should be going down the column. So here we would have Amazon. And where did it go? I thought I pasted that there. I guess I didn't. Threads septic. So here's what Google said about working with me. So much smart. Please take my money. Amazon said he created the system for our drones. Fred Septic said, so many customers, thanks to Michael. Now the benefits for working with me is on time, well, a few more specific projects on time. And we'll have generous, generous uh, compensation. No. Nah. Generous payment accepted. <laughs> and then we'll say, I just really fast typer. This is just stuff I'm thinking off the top of my head. It, just, it doesn't mean anything. Okay, so here's our table. And like I said, let's go back and make it look a little bit better using Bootstrap. Um, 
Okay. So, see, instead of using this, where to go? Instead of this border, which is an old thing, well, I mean, it's not old, but the bootstrap way is to use classes. So, we're going to use the table border. I think it's border. Table border. Table bordered. Ah! Oh, and now our table is bordered. Let's see, is there anything else that I want to do to my table? Info, warning, danger, active. So I guess I can make one of them active. Or info, how about... Let's just do that. Let's do one of them success. So this one we'll put class equals success. Oh boy! Actually, that's not what I wanted. I wanted the entire row to show that. Ah! Yes. Perfect. Okay. So that is code challenge number three. And, you know, once you're done with yours, you know, post a link to the pin in the discussion section so I can take a look at it. And so I can see what your benefits are or whatever your table is. It doesn't have to be the same as this. And I just want to congratulate you now for finishing up. Well, almost finishing. You still have a uh, quiz left but you've come a very long way. You know a lot about HTML now. I'm sure if you go back to CNN and look at their source code, you can actually decipher a lot of what is going on. Congratulations on completing the HTML section of this course. Now we are going to my favorite part, CSS. CSS lets you make beautiful things, and that is the power of cascading style sheet. Because as I showed you in the previous HTML lecture, that a website without CSS looks absolutely terrible, very unappealing. So we can make things look appealing and awesome to our customers, our viewers, with CSS. And it's so easy to use. I'll give you an example, just a simple example. Right, so let's make a paragraph. And hello, this is text. Right. Okay. So, what I can do to style this text, right, if I wanted to make this, say I wanted to make this, all of this strong. I just want to make this all strong. Okay. Let's say I have another paragraph that I make, some more text, but I also want to make this strong. And if I have even more paragraphs that I want to make and I have them strong, I'm going to have to apply that strong tag to every single paragraph, which is a pain. You don't want to do that. We're programmers. So here's the beauty of CSS. So I'm going to create a class. I'm going to call it bold. And I'm going to say font weight bold. Now I'm going to apply that class equals bold. And now it's bold. So let's go back to, let's just make a, another, or actually what I also could do, let's, let's do another thing. Oops. So let's get rid of that. Another thing you could do, which I don't suggest doing this, but it is the power of CSS. You can say for all paragraphs, make the font weight bold. And there you can see that it will make all the paragraphs bold doing that. I don't suggest doing it that way just because it doesn't give you as much power of manipulation as if you use classes or IDs, but it is an option. So let's get in deeper with some more CSS in the next video. Okay, let's go over CSS classes. Classes are the most frequently used thing in CSS and it is how you will style your HTML the majority of the time. So it's good to understand them. And I gotta tell you off the bat, be as specific as possible and give your classes good names like I taught you in the HTML lecture on classes. So let's reuse an old pin. And as we would in the, C um, the HTML section, let's give this a class of blog post title. And then for our H2 cars, let's have a class of blog post 
subtitle. And since we have two H2s, we will put the other one here as well. And then for, no, that's good for now. Okay, so let's say that we want to style our blog post title a certain way. So in CSS, you create a class with a dot. So you have the HTML class blog post title. So what you want to do is just copy that, paste it, and then give it the styles that you want. So let's say I want, um, let's say I want the the font family to be Tahoma, and it will change that to Tahoma. Now, consequently, I could also just say make all the H1s make H1 Tahoma. But what if I have another, you know, H1 somewhere on my vast website that is not a blog post title? Then that H1 is going to get the styles that I would want to give the blog post title, but not all the H1. So that's why using classes and being as specific as possible is the best practice. And not only that, when you're working with another person, using the good names and classes will help the other person you're working with know what you're styling and why you're styling it the way you are because if it's a blog post title you're gonna want it to stand out so I can see you know why I would give the font family a Tahoma or a font that is you know kind of bold and a little more vertical than it is horizontal because I want it to stand out to the eye so for the H2 our blog post subtitle we would do the same thing if we want to style it. First, the period. Then we would take, we would copy the HTML class, and we make a CSS class for that HTML class. So I'm going to specify this: that this in the HTML, this is an HTML class. This is a CSS class. You have to make them. You have to make the CSS match the HTML class in order for it to style. So if you mistype it or something's off then of course it's not going to work so for this one let's just say um, let's just make the color red and see it styles both of them now I don't have a lecture on IDs but I'll do them quickly you don't if you don't okay if you can avoid using IDs do it IDs are a last resort Unless you are using like JavaScript or something like that where an ID is required because you have to select. It acts as a selector. So in that case, an ID is important. But for using CSS and styling, use classes as much as possible. So let's have an ID and you do that by doing a hashtag. And let's just say blue, which means that anything styled or anything with the ID of blue, I want it to be styled with the color blue. So then let's give that to, let's give it to this uh, list. So let's do ID, oops, ID equals blue. Then you can see, well, you can't really see it, but it turned blue. So let's do font weight bold. So you can see it a little bit better. And that's, I mean, you can use that on anything. So let's do this ID equals blue. And then, you know, you can say, uh, let's do this ordered list class equals blog post title or blog post subtitle. I mean, you don't, you don't want to do this. This is very ugly and disorganized. But I'm just showing you how you can style things with CSS. But even if you wanted this ordered list to have a color of red, what you would want to do is give it its give its own class. So let's just make another well I'm okay. You want to be as specific as possible, but I'm trying to just make this an easy example. So like don't don't ever give a class of red or blue to anything. It's just it'll be way too confusing when you're trying to go back and do it. I'm just giving a practical example, so don't ever do that. Be specific as possible like this one, but don't ever make a class named red or something like that. Just don't do it. <laughs> All right. So in this video, you learned how to make a CSS class and an ID and how to style with it. In the next video, we're going to talk about 
the popular CSS div. In this video, you're going to learn all about the divs in CSS. Now divs, if you go to any website, you're going to see divs. And you're going to see divs everywhere. So let's give you an example. Let's go to cnn.com again. Let's inspect the element, look at his source code. And let's see. Div, div, div here, div there, div, div, everywhere. More divs. OK, so what a div is, it's like a container. It's a rectangle container that contains everything within that div. So I mean, div stands for divider. So let's make a div here. And let's make a div. So we want everything contained within, uh, let's just make a div around the header right now, or the blog post title. So that'll be our first div. And then our second div will contain all of the you know blog post content. Um, so I have a second div here. And where's the end of it? Right here. OK. So you can't see it unless we style it. So let's style it. Let's make the first one, the first div. Let's give it a class of um, blog post header div. Oops. Blog post header div. All right. Now let's make a CSS class for that class. And let's, so you can see it, let's give it a background color of um, blue. Let's say the, uh, the color white. So you can see that I can change the text color too inside of the div. So anything within the div is styled with the same styles as the, as the div. So here's the container here. And this is what it contains. So you can see everything it contains right here. And let's do the second example. Let's do the second div. And let's say this class is uh, blog post content. So let's take this HTML class. And let's make a CSS class. And let's make the background color red, which looks terrible for all of that. But then let's make the color black. Ah, see, can you can you figure out why the styles did not apply to the text? Right, it's because it's not the most specific thing. OK, so the div contains all these elements that have their own classes and styles. So just like in the uh, CSS hierarchy video, I showed you that you know things inside the HTML were styled a certain way, but then things in the body were styled a certain way. So the more specific you are, that overrides the more general ones. So here we have the more specific classes are overriding this div. So I hope you can see now that div is just a container for elements within the page, and it becomes essential when you're working with Bootstrap or any kind of you know, column-based um, work. In this lecture, we're going to go over the hierarchy in CSS. And I'll show you what I mean. Styling in CSS has specificity. And the more specific you are, the better, because it will outdo the more general terms. Here I'll show you. So we have a header. Let's say call the doctor. And let's say the doctor is in. And then we just have some te some text. Okay. So let's start styling this. So let's first say I want the HTML. Oops. Come on now, there we go. HTML have a background color of blue. Okay, so now you see that everything contained within the HTML tags has a background of blue. So then let's go 
be more specific and say everything within the body has a background color of white. So now you can see everything contained within the body section of the page has a background of white. So then let's go even more specific. Let's say H1 has background color of green. So now the H1 has a background color of green. Now we can get even more specific and let's do a class. Let's say class red. And it's just uh, background color red. Now let's give the H1 this class. And you'll see that the class is more specific than H1, so it rules, uh, it overrides the H1 styles. So let's go be even more specific and have an ID of uh, black. We'll say background color is black. And let's give, let's leave the H1 class red and let's also add the ID black. Now, can you guess what's going to happen? ID is much more specific. ID is the most specific that you can get. So the ID will overrule everything unless you do like an urgent or I mean important. Um, like it's something like I never use this, but if you put important next to it, it will make that override everything else. Um, I didn't put this important in the right place. I would, I don't remember where you put it because I never use it. It's bad practice and you really don't want to do that. But if you want to you know, do it, you can always Google it. But this is the hierarchy of styling in CSS. In this video, we'll go over how to style text. So what we could do is if we wanted all of our paragraphs to have red text, first we would just do, we would select all the paragraphs in CSS and say color red. Now we could also align all of them to the center, which would align all the text to the center. Or we could change it to right, left, or whatever. So can you guess how we can how we can align this paragraph to the left, this one to the center, and this one to the right. Go ahead and pause the video and try it out. All right, were you able to figure it out? I hope you use classes, because that's the best way to do it. So first, let's give this one a class of align me left. Then we'll give the second paragraph a class of align me center. And then for the last one, we'll give it a class of, you guessed it, align me right. All right, so what we're going to do is create a class for the HTML class, align me center. We'll do this one first, and we'll say text align center. All right, so let's do the other two. And let's do the left one first. So the class align me left, left, and then align right, right. So okay, let's say we want we want align me left and align me right to both be bold. There's a better way. Actually, this is kind of up to your preference. Every there can there can be more than one class, or you can put them in the same. So you can do it this way. You can do font weight equals bold, but then you have to do it twice. But then you won't have more than one class in here. But once you start getting into a bigger web page, you're going to have more than one class here anyway. So what I would do, I'm gonna put this in the wrong one. This should be on the right. Okay, so what I would do, I would create a new class called bold, and I would say 
font weight equals bold, and then get rid of these. Now give the left and the right one that new class. And there you can see both of them got that. And let's say, you know, we don't want to leave out the center after all, so let's just give the bold too. So there are a lot more things you can do to style the text. And if you want to check that out, I'll put a link in the Downloads tab to the right. All right, CSS Code Challenge number one, align me correctly. In this challenge, you will first create two paragraphs. Then you will align one to the left and then one to the right. Then give the paragraph on the left a background color of green. Then give the paragraph on the right a font color of blue. Change the font family of both paragraphs to Tahoma. Now, I do want to specify that you should use classes for this challenge. Do not select the paragraphs manually and do not use IDs. And once you're done, post a link to your pin in the discussion section and I'll check it out. Code challenge number four, align me correctly. Let's do the walkthrough. So I specified first that we're gonna use classes. We're not going to select the paragraphs manually. So if you selected the paragraphs manually, for shame. So let's first create our two paragraphs and let's make the first one, let's say Seth Rogen. And then the second one, we'll say is Batman. Is he really? I don't know, but he could be. All right, give the paragraph on the left. Oh, I skipped step two. Okay, align one paragraph to the left and one to the right. So let's give, let's do it this way. Let's do one left and we'll say um, text align is left and then we'll do right oops text to line equal right so let's give this the top one a class of left and it's already left so it's not going to change anything but the second one will change all right so Seth Rogen is still Batman all right so give give the paragraph on the left a background color of green so I'm gonna go ahead and rename these because it's left and right it's not specific enough because if somebody else looked at my code and they see left and right they're not really gonna know what I'm talking about so we want this to be as specific as possible and we want to get in a good habit of doing this so then left paragraph I said a background color of green so background color is green and there we go you know might as well change this color to white so we can actually see Seth Rogen and then give the paragraph on the right a font color of blue okay so a font color of blue and you can sort of see that it changed um, I'm gonna make this bold so I can actually see it see now you can see it's blue all right and then change the font family of both paragraphs to Tahoma so like I said do not select the paragraphs manually just create another class because I don't want to type font family twice in both classes so I'm just going to put uh, Tahoma text Oops, wrong thing and then Tahoma and then we'll give Tahoma text class to both of these and it changed the text to Tahoma now that's the end of the challenge uh, there's a link to my pin in the download section and feel free and please do share your pin in the discussion section and my pin is in the download section not the discussion section <laughs> all right I'll see you in the next lecture we'll go over CSS measurements in this lecture you're going to learn about the different measurements that we'll use 
and styling our text divs and other CSS elements. Now there are a lot of different measurements that we can use, but I'm not going to go over all of them because we're only going to mainly use two. But in the downloads resources tab, I will put some documentation if you want to check out the different ones like inches and millimeters and all that stuff. I've never used them. I've never seen them ever used, but it's there if you want to read up on it. Now pixels, we know pixels and n not all pixels are uniform across all browsers. So that's why M's are handy because it's a relative size that scales with the font and M's and percentages are mostly used in responsive designs which is almost every single website you should be building in a modern day web browser. So let's go to CodePen and just kind of check this out. So let's create a paragraph that says, um, go Longhorns, UT is awesome. Okay, so let's give it a class of go Longhorns. Okay, let's give that class. We're going to we're going to increase the font size. So I can do it in two ways. Like I said, I can use pixels or I can use M's. So first let's use pixels. Maybe it's already 16. I think 16 oh yeah, 16 is the default, so it's not changing. Okay, there we go. Okay, so there you can see that we changed the font size. And now let's use M's. So let's see the default is 1M. So that's what it looks like at default. So now let's do 2M's. Now you can see the M, right? That's a good reference. Now let's double that 4 and then 8. Then let's try to make it smaller. Oh, that's not going to change it. Another thing that we could use are percentages. So we could do 100%, which is going to be the default. We could do 400%, which makes it four times as big. Okay. You can also use this in a div. And I'll show you that real quick. For styling your divs or images, you could use these for images as well. Pretty much any container, and a paragraph is a container, right? It has lines around this, and then I can even show you this, that it's a container by saying, showing you the background, right? See, the paragraph is a container. So any kind of container you can, you can style this way. So let's just do div class. Um, Let's just say big, big red, big red. I want it to have a background color of red too. And I want it to have a width of 400 pixels and a height 200 pixels. See, or we could also change these to M's, let's say 40 M. And we could also, you know, cross do. I don't suggest doing two different ones. It's because it's not going to scale very well. So these are your CSS measurement tools now. And let's go into the next lecture. We'll, we'll go even more in depth on this subject. In this video, we're going to go over CSS boxes. Now here's a model for the border box. It's the border box model where you have your width and your height, and then you have your padding your border, and then your margin. Now with the border box model, the border and the padding are included inside of the box, and then only margin is on the outside. In the older model, the context box, the padding and the border were outside. And that created problems because when you wanted to set something, a uh, box to be 300 by 200, and then you put padding and then a border on top of it, then your box wouldn't be 300 by 200 anymore. It would be the 300, 200 plus whatever your padding and your border was. So the box would render bigger than what you wanted. So let's 
work with this in, ex in an example. So let's first create a box. So let's just put here is box one. Let's create two boxes. Okay. Now let's create classes for these. So box one. I want it to have a width of 300 pixels by 200 pixels. And background color of red. And then I want to have a border. Um, let's do five pixels, solid black. And let's put some padding on there too. Let's put 20 pixels all around. Okay. And I also want to center this, and here's a neat trick. If you ever want to center something in the middle of the screen, just do zero auto, margin zero auto. All right, so let's create our box number two. We're going to make it exactly like it, except without the padding and the border. And we're also going to separate them a little bit. So margin top, let's just do 50 pixels. Good. Okay. So you can see that the top box is larger than the bottom box, even though the width and the height are the same. The top box is bigger because the border and the padding add on to it, as I described earlier. So let's do a, a reset for this and include the border box model. So you can always just Google for it. It's called border box reset. Or you can save it in something like Evernote or you memorize it. So I need to fix this real quick because there is a thing after this. There you go. Okay, so now you can see that both boxes are the exact same size. See what happens is, that, like I said, in the border box model, the padding and the border are included. They're put inside the box instead of outside. So you look what happens whenever I delete this, then the padding and the border are applied on the outside of the box. Now that took me a little while to you know understand, so I hope I made that clear. And we're going to go more in depth on this, boxes and positioning and floating in the next few videos. So you'll have plenty of practice to get this done. Now let's enter the wonderful world of document flow in CSS. I'm sure you've heard of floating elements and how much of a headache it can be at first. It does take some practice, so let's just go ahead and dive into an example. Okay, here we have an example blog post with some dummy content and a picture of some gummy worms. Now, let's say that I want the text to be on the left and the image to be on the right. And I want them on the same line. So how can I do that? Well, it's easy. You just float the image to the right. And now we have exactly what we wanted. Okay. Now let's make this article a little more appealing. So let's give it a background color of gray. Let's make the font readable. And also give it some padding to make it look better. There we go. Now the image doesn't look like it fits completely within this container and that's because the image is outside of the container. Now instead of manipulating the image directly by hand, like changing its width and height, what we can do is take the image and put it inside of the article container. Like this. But then we apply what is called a clear fix, like this, overflow auto. And what this does is it takes into consideration the child containers of the parent container. So in this example, the article container is the parent container, and the image is the child container. So the parent container overflows to allow the child container to be within it. So I'm also going to fix the margins on this. So 
There we go. Okay, good. So let's say that I want another image in my blog post. So let's just put another image. And we see that these are on the same line. Well, I don't want these on the same line. I want them stacked on top of each other. So how can I do this? So what I can do is create a class, image2, and I want it to be on the right, right underneath the top image, I'm just going to clear the right. And now we're going to apply this class to image2, as image2. There you can see we have exactly what we wanted, and the parent container takes into consideration its new child container and expands itself to allow both children to exist within that container. So I'll give one more example of floats. So I'm going to fork this pin because I'm going to change it. And then I'm just going to take the images and I'm going to delete everything else. I don't need the article anymore. And so I don't want this to clear right now. I want to have Actually, I want these to float left. So what I want is I want to have four pictures in a row. Then after that, I want to have another four pictures under that. So let's do that. Let's have another two pictures. Okay, now I want another four underneath. So let's put four. Okay, so now on the fourth one, one, two, three, four, now let's give this one a class of image2 and it's not going to clear because they're all floated left right now. Oops, I should say left. <laughs> there we go. Now I'm going to clear this left and they're all going to move down. See, you can control how your images or any other box elements are displayed on your page by doing this, by using flow. And that is the power of flow. So I hope this made sense to you because in the next lecture, we're going to have your next code challenge where you'll be working with this as well as the things you learn in the CSS boxes lecture. So I'll see you there. Let's walk through the solution for code challenge number six. Okay, step one, create a box with a width of 300 and a height of 600. Let's make a div. We'll just put this container. All right, let's create a container class with a width 300 pixels and a height 600 pixels. All right, so Step two is to give the box a border, which is good because I can't see the box right now anyway. So solid black. And there it is. Okay. Now give it a padding of 20 pixels. All right. Horizontally center the box. So remember this trick. Zero auto. Boom. There it is. All right, step five, create another box within the first box. Okay, you can do that. So let's name this box one. Okay, box one. Now box one has a height of 50% and a width of 90%. So it has a height of 50%. A width 90%. Okay, now give it a border of one pixel solid black. All right, now align the box to the center of its parent box. So zero auto. Give the box some text and align it to the center. So let's just some text. Let's take it literally. Alright, so text align 
center. All right, now give the text some padding so it's not squished at the top. So let's just add some padding top. Uh, 10 pixels is good. Yep. Okay, so this is going to create a problem for our next couple. Well, I'll show you. Maybe you ran into this problem, maybe you didn't. So let's just go ahead and create the next two boxes. And if the problem comes up, you'll see it. And we'll fix it. So we have box two. So let's see, box two. Box two um, has a height and width of 50%. Width 50%. And it has a border, one pixel, solid black. Okay, first off, we can see what the problem is. First, that this is not going to work because the first box, the padding has made it bigger than what it actually is. So what we have to do is, if you've remembered, to do the border box reset. So we're gonna go in here and make the reset. And there we go. So now the next step is to get these into the same box. I'm gonna float them left. Okay. And then step three is to center them horizontally within their parent container. So again, margin zero auto. And also the text align center, text align center. Good. And I also want to give this a margin top just because it looks, it looks bad. So much better. Actually, I'll do a little bit more. Okay. I like that. Code challenge number five complete. How'd you do on this code challenge? Did you struggle? Did you get it all right? Let me know in the discussion tab and share your pin with me so I can see what you did. And in the next video, we're going to go over positioning elements in CSS. I'll see you there. So far, you've learned about CSS boxes and how to float your elements on a page. Now we're going to talk even more about positioning elements on a page. So there are different positions you can use for each element. The default for every element on a page is static, which means that it's not positioned in any way. Another position you can use is relative, which means you can position that element in regards to the page. So let's give an example of that. Let's have a div class, relative. I'm just gonna make a box. Okay, we're gonna give it a height, three, 200 pixels. And background color red. Okay, now let's give it a position relative. So now we can move it around on the page. So let's see how this works. Let's say I want to move from the left 30 pixels. You can see it moved from the left 30 pixels. Now I can move it from the top. Let's say I want to move it from the top 500 pixels and it moves down 500 pixels. This is handy if you want to position some text on top of an image, or if you just want to position an element in an exact position on your website. Another position that you can use is absolute, which means that that element is going to be placed absolutely within its parent container. Now, unless you place it within a parent container, the default parent container is the body. So let's copy this. Let's put another one here just going to be right on top of each other. Actually, it's going to be below because we haven't floated it. See, let's see what happens when we float, when we float it left. And there we go. See, now they're in the same line. Okay. So now let's give this a class of absolute. We can just copy and paste most of this because I want to give an example. So let's change this color to green. 
Okay. So right now, the two elements are stacked on top of each other, even though they have the same coordinates and height and width, because they're both set to relative, which means it's going to create space for other elements. Now let's change the absolute to an absolute position. And now you're going to see that the element with an absolute position is going to be fixed in this position over all things. So if you have text or anything that goes under this element, this element is going to be on top unless you change the Z positioning. This also creates a problem if you use the body as the parent container because as you scroll down through the website, this green box is going to stay here and this absolute position is going to stay here. So that means as you scroll down, anything that comes under this green box will not be visible. So that's why it's always a good idea to put it in your own parent container. And you do that just by creating another box like I showed in previous videos. Another position that you can use is the fixed position, which is kind of like the absolute position, except it's going to remain fixed in that position no matter what. So here you have this absolute green box that's going to stay here in its parent container no matter where you scroll. But let's say you have, let's say you create like a footer. And you want this footer to always be visible no matter what. So let's make that footer real quick. Let's give it a width of 100%. Let's give it a background color of black and a height of 50 pixels. Okay. First I want to get rid of the preset margins. So right. So now let's give this a position of fixed. Now we want it to stick to the bottom. So I spelled bottom correctly. And now the footer will always be here in this exact position at the bottom of the web page, no matter where we scroll on the page. So this could be used for things like if you want a fixed navigation on top, or if you want a live support chat for your website that is always displayed in that area. It's very useful for different elements. And we're going to put all these together in one of our upcoming code challenges. So this can be a little confusing at first and it definitely takes some practice. So I'm going to upload some more documentation on the downloads tab for you to look at and also feel free to play around with this code pen, especially the absolute position because positioning is very important. And in the next lecture, you're going to have a quiz over CSS boxes. All right, let's complete this code challenge. So first, I'm going to get the images that I want to use. So let's go to place hold it. Right, so for this I want to use 300 by 100. So let's go here to the source and replace this image with 300 by 100. There we go. Right. Let's go to the rest of these pictures, the sources. Let's just paste it. Looks like I skipped picture number one. Picture number four. Picture number five. And picture number six. Nope. Oh. Picture number seven. Picture number eight. Okay, so that was tedious. All right, now let's go to the next part. So let's look at the, the classes of these divs. So the div that contains all of them is picture body. 
And then the div that contains each picture, so the picture, the header, and then the picture, and then the text, that's called picture group. So let's create a CSS class called picture group. And so the first thing I want to do is I want to have all the pictures, these picture groups elements, I want them I want them aligned. I want them stacked. So I'm going to float them. I'm going to float left because I want it to go from the topmost element to the bottommost element from left to right. All right. So I know I want four pictures per row. So I'm going to set a width of 25%. And let's see. I guess it would help if I put my semicolon. There we go. All right. So what do I want to do next? How about we, I want this text aligned to the center. So I'm going to do text align center. Good. Now it would help if we did the border next, because I'm not going to be able to, you know, really adjust anything unless I can see where everything is. Plus, we want a border anyway. So let's do one pixel, solid black. Perfect. And the picture showed it that the heights are a little off. So let's adjust the height. Let's do um, height is. 200 pixels. Well, no, that's not right. <laughs> 300 pixels. There, that was a lot better. Yep. Because the 200 pixels didn't contain enough space for all this to fit inside of it. So, the only thing that it's missing now is this text on some of these. It's too close to the, the sides. So let's, let's fix that. Let's give it a Let's give it a padding of five pixels. And, you know, that's still a little close, so let's try 10. There, I like that. I like that much better. Well, and that's all there is to this code challenge. Once you're done, post a link to your pin in the discussion tab, and I'll take a look at it. See you in the next lecture. Let's talk about CSS resets. So a problem that many front-end web developers have is that in one browser, the website will look a certain way, but in another browser, the website will not look the same because the browser doesn't support the same fonts or it renders the code a little differently. This especially happens in older Internet Explorer browsers. So what you can do to combat this is use what is called a CSS reset. And there are a number of different CSS resets. For example, here you have the Meyer web reset. So you have a bunch of built-in CSS stylings that you can just copy and paste into your CSS. You also have CSS or normalize. This is probably the most popular. See, it sets the margins to zero and it also has our border box that we worked with earlier. It has the box setting the border box. So again, all you would do is you would just copy this and include it in your CSS. And you don't even have to use all of it either. Say you like some stuff from Normalize, you would just take that. And say you like some of the stylings from uh, the CSS Meyer reset, you just take some of that. And then you will have consistency across most browsers, at least, you want to get as much consistency as possible. But 100% consistency isn't possible. But you can improve that with CSS resets. And in the next video, you're going to learn how to make your website responsive for mobile devices and different viewports. Now you're going to learn how to make your website responsive for different viewing ports and mobile devices using media queries. So let's do an example. First, we're going to create a container. And 
we're going to put an image and some text in that container. First, let's style the container. Let's give it a height 250. Let's give it a width 500 pixels. Let's give it a border too. All right. Now I want this box to be centered horizontally and vertically. So why don't you pause the video right now and you know make a pin just like this and try to do it. Okay, did you do it? So how I'm going to do it, so I'm gonna make its position absolute. I'm going to give it a top of zero, left zero, bottom zero, and right zero. So right now it's positioned absolute in this area. It's not going to move. So now what do I do is to give it a margin of auto, and boom, it's centered both vertically and horizontally. So now we're going to add an image to the container. There's an image that I have. I'm just going to copy and paste it. And right now it doesn't fit. So let's change this to image. Let's have a, a width 100% and a height 100%. And my error is that I made this a class. This is not a class, it's an image. Okay, so now my image fits my container. So now we're going to have even more fun. I'm gonna make some media queries to make my hamster disappear. So media screen and min width 900 pixels. Okay, now let's do image display none. Ah, oh, my hamster's gone. So this media query right here means that for this rule, the image display none to take effect, the viewing screen size must be 900 pixels or less. So now let's create a paragraph in here. It's going to say, where is my hamster? And we're going to style this. Okay. Now we're going to make another media query, except this time it's going to be for when the viewing screen is 900 pixels or more. I'm just going to change this paragraph. Change this to max width. Now, save the pin. Now, let's take it full screen and test it out. There's my hamster. See? Right when we cross the 900 pixel mark, the rules take effect. I'm going to show you another neat trick to make your website images and elements responsive, but without using media queries. So when I reduce the page width, my hamster got cut off. So what I want to do then is create a max width for the container. That means it can be 500 pixels or less. So now let's see what this looks like. So there's my hamster and keeps getting smaller, and instead of getting cut off, he adapts to the page. So that's how you can make your website responsive for mobile devices in different size screens. And in the next lecture, we're going to go over CSS frameworks, what they are, when to use them, and how to use them. In this lecture, you're going to learn about CSS frameworks. Now this lecture is going to be fairly short because we won't be using CSS frameworks in this course, but I will be using them in future courses. Now, a CSS framework has a bunch of built-in functionality, so you don't have to start from ground zero. So let's take a look at Bootstrap. So if you use Bootstrap, you're going to get all of this stuff off the bat. 
So you don't have to start from scratch. Now this means faster development and your projects will get done faster. But don't just dive into a CSS framework. Nothing beats knowing how to do it by hand. And that is the error that a lot of beginners make is they'll jump into these frameworks. And then once they come to a problem, they won't know how to properly solve the problem because they don't have the CSS basics down like I've taught in this course. Now, Bootstrap is not the only framework. You see, we got a lot of choices, a lot of good choices too. It just depends on what kind of work you're doing, what kind of website you're building. So that's it for CSS frameworks for now. In the next video, I'm going to give you the key takeaways and a cheat sheet for CSS. Here is your code challenge final. There are no instructions for this final. You are just to replicate this website completely. Now, this is a mobile website too. So I have separate styles for under 700 pixels. So I'll show you, when it gets under 700 pixels, the styles change. And this is for a mobile device. So let's go back and I'll show you the full width we have a logo, then we have some navigation links. These aren't links, but you can make them links if you want. And when I hover over them, the background turns red and it pops out. I have an area for content with the 350 by 150 image you can get from Placehold It. Well, some dummy text. And when the browser is condensed, the text will wrap around the image. So keep in consideration, too, that when everything condenses, how everything shifts with the browser. So remember what I said about using percentages to make things more responsive. Keep that into consideration when you're completing this challenge. And also here, I have a sidebar with a link in the center. And down here, I have a footer with a form to input my email and then a button to sign me up. Notice too that the footer always stays there. I can scroll up and down, but the footer is always here. And the footer will always be on top of anything. Nothing will overlap with the footer. So make sure you have that also in the consideration. Now in the mobile styles, none of these have a hover effect because usually when you're on a mobile device you can't hover anyway. The navigation's changed and then you change some of the, the styles here for the content section as well as the sidebar. The sidebar has now collapsed under the content section. So you have everything you need in order to complete this challenge. And I have full faith that you can complete this challenge whether it's 30 minutes or a couple hours it doesn't matter because that practice is absolutely necessary to become a good web developer. In the next video, I'll show you how to complete this challenge. I'm going to split this code challenge up into two parts. One for the regular size website, and the second one will be for the mobile. So there are many ways to complete this challenge, and they can all be correct as long as the output is the same. So what I have may be a little different from yours, but as long as the output's the same, then it's correct. And if your output is different from mine, post a link to your pin in the discussion section so we can all check it out and see how you completed this challenge. So what I'm going to do first is I'm going to create the navigation. And then inside of that, let's do this first. So since this is just going to be a one-page website, I'm not going to worry too much about classes, even though I said that you should give everything a class. But just for this example, on a one-page website with not very much content, it's okay. So we're going to create some styles for the nav. So first, actually first what I want to do is because we're going to have problems with the margins, I want to apply a CSS reset. And in CodePen, you can go to Settings, you go to CSS, and you can go and select Reset. It also has Normalize too, but I'm just going to use Reset for this example. Now that does not apply the border box, 
So I'm going to go ahead and do that. But you don't have to use border box if you don't want. I'm used to working with border box, so it helps me. So what we're going to do is we're going to set the width to 100%. Now I'm going to make the height just 50 pixels. We could always adjust it later. And I wanted a border on the bottom. I want it to be one pixel, solid red. All right, there we have it. And so now let's add our logo. So we have a paragraph, and I'm going to give it a class of logo. And it's just my website. Okay, let's create a class for that. So logo. And since I'm going to have some other navigation on this, I want it to be on the same line. So I'm going to float this element to the left. And it's also, you know, stuck up here. But first I want to make it the font size that I want it to be, which is probably around 25 pixels. I want it a little bit bigger than that. There, that's good. So now I'm going to bring it where I want it, since it's a little squished in that corner. So I'm going to give it, first I'm going to give it some padding on the left, and let's just say 30 pixels again. Let's see, bring it down to, we'll give it some 4 pixels. Uh, that's, no, that's alright, we might adjust it later whenever we put our navigation up here in the center. So let's go ahead and do that then. What we're going to do then is create an ordered list. And we're just going to have three, three items. We'll fix that. So one of them is Hutton. Second one is About. Third is contact. So let's fix this first. First, let's change this from being stacked on top of one another to in a line. So we have nav. So what this is, is I'm selecting the elements, the list items within this, within the navigation, unordered list, list item. So that's a very specific selection. But I mean, of course, I could always give it a class. But like I said, in this kind of example where there's not much content, it's okay to select things like this without getting confused. So let's do display in line. Now our items are displayed in a line. Now let's give them a margin to help spread them out. So 50, 50 pixels. We might do a little bit more, but let's first increase the font. Let's make the font, how about uh, 20 pixels? That's, that's about right. So now, let's go up one to the unordered list. And we're going to give it a margin left to separate it from this logo, because I want these to be in the center. I want these to be in the center. I can just go to the nav. And then I can say, actually, no, I would go to this one. I would say text align. That would bring them over, but then the margin's kind of screwing it up. So, first I'm just going to bring it down. So let's give it some margin on top. Actually, I don't want the margin, because if I use margin, it might push this down too. It'll push the border down too, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to use padding. So I'll give it a padding of 16 pixels, bring it down. See, I'll show you what I'm talking about. It might, it'll push it down. See, I don't want it to push this border down. And the reason it's pushing it down is because, like I said, I'm using border box. So margins on the outside of the box and padding's on the inside. So if I want the outside, which is this border, to stay within that 50 pixels that I set the height for, I'm going to use a padding and not margin. The logo doesn't look like it's quite in line with that, so I'm going to bring it down just a little bit. And also, again, I'm going to use padding and not margin because I don't want it to move the height from my, my uh, 
my navigation height that I set. So this is good enough for now. We might come back and readjust the aligning later depending on the different elements in our page. But before we go, I said I wanted to make it to where when I hover over those, the navigation, it's going to change the background and it's also going to change the color. And it's going to make the, the text pop out. So what I do for that, I'm going to select this again but with the hover attribute. And then I have that color saved. So I'm going to go ahead and select that. I'm going to copy and paste it in there. So now when I hover over this, it turns white. Why is it turning white? Oh, because I forgot the B. There we go. Okay. Now, the problem here is I want this to be a bigger box whenever I hover over this. So to do that, I can change the padding. Because, again, remember the padding is on the inside of the box. So by making the padding, I'm going to increase the red. Because if I did the margins, it would be the outside. See, I'll show you. See, now the box is bigger. Now if I change this to the margin, it's not going to change the red. See, it's going to be the same size. So I want to use the padding for that. And I also said I wanted the text to be a little bit bigger, so let's do font size. And what did I have it set to? 20 pixels? So let's just make it, I want it to be kind of subtle, so 22 pixels. Yeah, that's good. And I also don't want to go over my border here, so that's, that's perfect. All right, the next step is to create the section for the content. So we're going to have a section. Okay, and so I had an image and some text. So let's do the image first. And then I have the, the link from the placeholder it's saved here in my Evernote. So I'll copy and paste it. We're going to style this in a minute. I'm just going to get all the text. Done. So I'm going to get some dummy text now. And I'm going to make this paragraph contain the dummy text. Okay. So now let's style the section. So I don't like this being up against the top navigation like this. So we're going to bring this down. We're going to have a margin top 100 pixels. That looks better. And then we're also going to have, well first, let's see, we got to fix, I want to fix this wrapping real quick. Because I want the image, I want the text to wrap around the image, I want the image to be on the left. So let's select the image, let's float it left. There, now we have the text here. So then we're going to, we're going to give it some margin, we're going to give it margin, 10 pixels. Then I also want this to be in line with my text though. So let's just do margin. So I don't want any margin on the top or the bottom. So margin, 10 pixels, 10 pixels. That's good. Okay, now let's fix the paragraph to make it, make the font size a little bit bigger. So section B. E. We're going to make the font size 18 is a pretty good font size for reading on a full screen browser. But also to help reading, we want to increase the line height to about 1.5 m's. Yeah, that looks pretty good. Now let's add some padding here on the right because that doesn't look too good. So we're going to add some padding here in this section. Let's say padding is 5 pixels. That looks better. Okay, so now the next step is to go down and let's create the sidebar. So under the section, we're going to make a div, div class, sidebar. And there we go. And let's style the sidebar. What I'm going to do is I'm going to force the sidebar to be on the right and I'm going to make it be there no matter what. So I'm going to give it a position of absolute 
and right, zero pixels. I'm going to give it a height of 60% and a width 15% because I'd like it to be a little responsive. It doesn't look like it's showing up yet, probably because it's interfering with the content. So let's give this a border. We're going to give it a border anyway, but this will help us see what's going on. Okay, yeah, see, it's getting pushed down by this, but I want it to be on the same line. So the section comes first before the sidebar, so that means all we have to do is float this to the left. And there we go. Now this overlaps, and the reason this is overlapping is because the sidebar has a width of 15%, but the section has a width of 100% because it's a block element. So we're going to change this. We're going to give this a margin, margin right 15%. There we go, now it's fixed. So I actually made a mistake and I floated the wrong thing. I floated the paragraph in the section rather than the entire section itself. So there. Now we also need to give the sidebar a margin on top, a margin top of 100 pixels to align it with the content section. So let's do that. Okay, very good. So we can see here that this isn't lining up very well. So we see that the image has padding, or actually margin, of 10 pixels on the left and the right. Let's go ahead and give that to paragraph section as well. And now it's perfect, it lines up. So inside the sidebar I had a link. So let's create that. It doesn't go to anything, so let's just put that. And the anchor text is some useful articles. Okay, so let's go to the sidebar. And I wanted this to be in the center, so let's text align that. And the reason we do the text align here to where it affects that, so sidebar is the parent container for the text. So if you want the text in a container to behave a certain way, you put the text rules in that container. But also, as I said earlier in the previous lectures, that specificity also matters. So see here I have section P, it's 18 pixels, but if I put here in section, do a font size of, you know, 30 pixels, then the section P is going to override this section font style. But when I take this out, then it will turn to 30. See, that's the specificity as well. So let's take this back out. Okay. Now, I wanted to bring this down. So let's go ahead and give that some padding. So, let me find it. So I'm just going to go ahead and put padding inside the sidebar rather than give this margin. So I'm just going to give it a padding of, so I just want the padding on top. So let's do it about 20 pixels. That's good enough. So now I want to, actually I want to increase this size to kind of fit the rest of my, the font sizes on my page. So let's go ahead and select that, sidebar A. Let's give it a font size of, let's see, what did I put my other links up here? So nav, font size, 20 pixels. So let's make this 20 pixels as well to keep consistency. So there we go. All right. So now let's create the footer. And first, I'm going to make the border. So let's give the footer, let's see, I think let's do about 20 pixels. Actually, I don't know if I want to use pixels or if I want to use percentages because I used, what did I use for the navigation? Because I want to stay consistent. I did, I used pixels. So I'm going to use pixels down here as well. Let's give it a height of, let's do about 50 pixels as well. Now let's give it a border. Border top, one pixel, solid black. And it's not displaying. 
And the reason why it's not displaying is because I haven't given it the width. Nope, that's not the reason. Oh, okay, my footer is displaying. It's up here though. So let's make this border one pixel. We'll make it even bigger, see? It's getting squished up there. And the reason it's getting squished up here is because I have the margins on top of both the sidebar and the content. So what I want to do for this is I just want it to be fixed at the very bottom anyway. So let's go back to border top one pixel and we're going to make the position let's say I just want it here fixed like if a person just scrolls down through my website I want this footer to always be visible here so I'm just gonna make this fixed and I'm going to give it a bottom of zero pixels now our footer is on bottom so now let's create our form with some text so join our mailing list and I want the text to be aligned to the center. And let's we'll come back to the font. So now let's create the form. Input type equals text name email placeholder is enter your email. Now we'll have our submit button input type equals submit and we'll have value is sign sign me up well, let's give this a padding let's give it a padding of mm, 10 pixels Okay, that's good. So now I want this top navigation to line up with my footer, but I also want to make it to where it stays in proportion with the rest of the page as it gets smaller. So for that, I'm going to use percentages. And first, I'm going to have to get rid of this text align center. So I'm going to do margin left because I'm creating space between this and that for 25%. Could use a little bit more, 30%. Use a little bit more. Actually, that's a little too much. That's about right. So now, when we collapse it, it stays in proportion with this. Actually, you could use a little bit less, so it stays in better proportion. By this point, it's going to collapse anyway, because it's going to be 700. So let's go ahead and set that. I know in the next one, in the next video, I'm going to go over the media queries and how to make it responsive. But right now, I just want to make sure that I have this in line so it just looks good. So let's create the media query. We're gonna have a max, max width of 700 pixels. And we'll just want an indicator for when this happens. So whenever this happens, let's just make the image display none. That way we know. Okay, so the break is right here. About here. So I can't really make this any closer without looking terrible. So that's pretty good proportion. So I like that. So let's go ahead and save the pin. And that's it for this part of the code challenge. On the next video, we're going to go over how to make this website responsive for under 700 pixels viewing device. So I'll see you in the next lecture. Now let's set up our website for a mobile device. So I went ahead and I cleared the image display we had here. And what I'm going to do first is I'm going to make all these other rules that we have. I'm going to make them only apply to a screen size larger or wider than 700 pixels. Now the reason why I want to do this is because if we don't specify this, then all of these rules that we have here, they'll bleed over into the other media query section for the smaller screen size. And we don't want that because then we'll have margin and padding problems just all over the place. 
And I'm going to go ahead and also indent these just to make it look better. So I just highlighted everything and pressed tab. Okay. So I need this to be a min width. There we go. I'm going to go ahead and save that. Okay. So now we can get started on our mobile design, which usually you would want to start with mobile first. But in this case, since this isn't a course specifically on response, responsive design, then we're just going to start with what we've worked with the most. So here's close to the break. So what do we want to do first? So first, let's, let's change the navigation. We want everything to be aligned to the center. So let's have a text align. Center. We also want to increase the height to 260 pixels. There we go. It just wasn't, wasn't far enough yet. So we lost all of our styles, which is fine. We can redo everything. So I'm going to go back up to my nav, and I want all this to stay the same. So let's go back here. Okay. And did this. I don't want duplicate heights. There we go. All right, so the next step is we want nav an ordered list. And then we're also going to want to do the nav the list items in that. So let's go back up here, see what we have. So I still want these to be in an ordered manner, but first let's do the logo because I'm not going to be able to style everything else unless I have the logo done. So don't want to float this left. The font size needs to maybe come next. Nah, the font size is fine. I don't need any padding. Well, I might need padding up top. Yeah, I'm going to need padding up top, but not left up top. Okay, so now let's give these elements, I want them to have margin of 10 pixels. More, and some more. Actually, like I said, for this I want to use padding because I don't want to push that border down. So padding of 30 pixels. That's good, but we're going to want to increase the font size of these. So font size. Let's see what we had before. Font size is 20 pixels. That's good. Mm, the padding, the padding needs to come down a little bit. Yeah, that's good. All right, we can always adjust some more of that later, but that's pretty good for our navigation. So now let's go down and do our section. That's the next thing, yes, section. So section, we're gonna set the width to 100%. We're also going to, we want this image to be aligned to the center. So let's text line center. There we go. We're gonna add some padding to the sides. Let's do 15 pixels. Let's use a little bit more. Hmm, that's pretty good. So then I want to add some margin under the image. So margin bottom. Let's do four pixels. Let's do a little bit more. Eight. That's nah, a little bit more. Because how much do we have up here? I would like this to kind of align with that. So you have 25 on top. So let's just put 25 on bottom. There, so now it's equal. Okay, so now the image and the text, the text I want to be a little bit bigger. And I also want that line height back. So let's see what we had up here. I wanna just take exactly this because I liked how it looked. Even if you're on a mobile device, you still want 
the text to be big enough to read. I can actually maybe use maybe 20. It's a little too big, never mind. Okay, that's good. All right, so now let's go to the sidebar and style the sidebar. So we wanted the first text align to the center. There we go. I also want a border on top. So border top to separate this. And of course I want the padding too. I want the padding top. So just give padding all around, that's fine. Okay, and I also want to specify a height for it. So what was the height before? So the height, 60%. And the width, oh, that's right, I need to specify the width. Now, the width needs to be 100%. And then the height, let's do 60, let's try that. It might not work, no. Let's just do 300 pixels. There. Okay. Now, we're going to, actually we need to change that. We need to change the link font size. Let's just take this. There we go. All right, so now let's do the footer. And I still want this to be fixed to the bottom. So bottom pixels. I want the text to be in the center. Also, I want the border. Let's see what we have up here. Pretty much everything I have up here I would just like to use again. So let's just take all of this and just use it again. There. I'm going to save the pen. I'm going to open this and a new page. I mean, I'm going to open it in full page, so I save it. Let's open it in full page. Okay, so let's now go and see what it looks like. And this becomes responsive. All right. So it looks pretty good. You can maybe fix this a little more. Let's see what happens when we keep going. That's pretty good. One problem, though, I can see here is if this ever overlaps, then it's going to look bad because you're going to be able to see through it. So I want to prevent that from happening. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to add a background color of white. I'm also going to take that and put it in the other section as well. Because you definitely don't want that to overlap because it would just look terrible. And I do want to fix this just real quick. Let's bring this up. So let's bring that up. All I want to do is bring up the height a little bit. So let's just change this from that to 240, 230. 240, 240 was good. All right. Let's give it one final look. That looks pretty good. All right. Final code challenge complete. How did you do? Did you need any help? Did you have to look up anything? That's totally fine if you did. I had to look up stuff too. <laughs> so, I mean, any, any programmer has to do it. But I would like to see how you solve this problem. So just post a link to your pen in the discussion section. I'll take a look at it, grade you, see how awesome you did. You've come a very long way. I'm so proud of you, you learned so much. You've now officially finished the learning part of this section. And now, all we have is the course project left where you're gonna build a clone of the BBC website. So again, I am so proud of you for coming this far and I'll see you in the next lecture. Congratulations on completing the learning portion of this course. Now, it's time for the course project. We are going to build a clone of the UK BBC website. Let's take a look at it. Now, the reason I chose the UK News BBC website is because when I did this project a few years ago, this is what a headhunter saw on my GitHub account and how I got my first job interview and front-end web developer work. 
So for nostalgia, we're going to redo this, and the site has changed since then, so it'll be a fun little exercise for both of us. Okay, let's take a look at this. So we have a top header navigation. We have another section that holds just some text for news. I guess this could be a logo, or you could just make this a font. Then we have another navigation that goes 100%. Then there's more navigation underneath. We're just going to stop around right here. And I also want to add that none of this content is mine. It all belongs to BBC, and this video is for entertainment purposes only. Just gotta put that legal disclaimer in there. <laughs> I'm going to cut this project up into different sections so that it's not just one long video. So the first thing we're going to do in the next video is create our containers that will have one for each navigation as well as a container for the content. So the first step is creating our container. So let's have a div class container. Since this is going to be fairly long, I'm going to make a comment that this is for the container. This is going to contain everything. So I'm just going to go ahead and push that down. All right. So let's see how many bars we need. We need one, two, three, four bars, and then a content section. So let's go ahead and create those. So the div class top bar. And then so what can we name the next one? We'll just say news, news bar. Then the next one will be, um, let's call it category bar. And the next one we'll call location bar. And the last one we're gonna have is our content. All right, let's space these out. And again, I'm going to go ahead and write some comments for each one. This will be top bar. This is just to help me organize, not have to waste time later on. If, if one of the divs accidentally gets deleted or something changes, then I don't have to try to play games to figure out which is which. Also helps other people who are reading my code. All right, so let's go ahead and create the top bar. So top bar has a background color of white. I'm going to set its width for 100% because that is what it stretched across the entire thing. All of them do. And then let's take a look at its height. I have a nifty measuring tool here. It's called Page Roller. It's an extension for Chrome. You can find it in the extension part. So I'm going to see what the pixels are on this. So the height Height's about 40 pixels. I mean, I, I could also go to the source code, but if I'm just going to look at the source code, then there's really no point in me doing this by hand. So I'm going to do it this way. Let's go ahead and we'll say that the color is black. And one thing I can look at, though, is I want to see the font family for this. It looks like sans serif. So down here, we have all that good stuff. The padding, the minimum height. Just keep going up because I keep inheriting. Keep inheriting, there we go, font family. Yep, sans serif. Well, sans serif is the default. 
See what this font family is first is these. And if this browser doesn't support this, then it's Hel Helvetica, haha. Uh -huh. And then Free Sans and Sans Serif. So let's do that. Okay. All right, so there's nothing showing up here because the background color is white. So until we have this done, let's make it. Actually, what we can do, no, let's just make it a different color for now. Okay, so you know how to fix this. We're going to actually make the body margin zero. All right. Okay. So then let's do which bar is next? The news bar? Yeah. News bar. Let's take a look at the height. 60 pixels. So I want to make this consistent, so I'm just going to do them in the same order, even though I'm not filling them out yet. Height, 60 pixels. So I have another extension here that's pretty nifty. It's called Color Picker, or actually Colorzilla. So I'm going to click on this color, and then it's copied to my clipboard. And now I'm going to paste it here for the background color. I'm going to go ahead and make this white. So I know it's because I know it's there. Now for the font, it's white. It's color white. And let's see. Need the font family. I think what I want to do is I'm just going to actually, if this is the same, I'll just apply it to the entire body. Let's see what font this is. It's not going to show font, is it? It's an SVG because it's an image. This isn't an actual font, though. It's an image. It's an SVG. Okay, so that's not an actual. That's not an actual text. That's not actual text. It's an SVG, which is like an image. So what I'm going to do for now is I'm just going to apply this font family to everything on the page, because. If that inherited it from that far back, then everything else will probably inherit that as well. So that's pretty good. And if it doesn't look right, we can always fix it. So now we have, oops, I want to pick from the page. We have the next one, which is, which bar is this? Our category bar. Okay, so let's check out the height. 37. 37, that's not right. 30, I'll go with 30. Okay. Category bar. Could just copy and paste all of this. So I'm gonna do that. And what did I say, 30? Okay. And then the color white oops colors already there silly silly me okay so now we have the next bar which is white so that's pretty easy let's go ahead and do that I'm just gonna copy and paste this the next bar is location bar location e bar huh so <laughs> it's white width is that and uh, let's see the height is, let's say it's about there, about 36. Oh, I wonder if that has padding on it though. Let's just put it for 40. You can always change it. It's easier for me to calculate the values for the rest of my containers if I have nice, you know, whole round numbers and not something like 42 or 41. So I'll just go with 40. Then for our content, let's have it as, I'm just gonna go ahead and put it as 100%. So what we'll do here is I'm going to include this little sidebar over here, but I think what I'm gonna do is just position it relatively to this. So I'm just gonna make this all one big container and then I can just position things how I want them. So let's go ahead and do the same. 
white width is 100. The height is, get rid of this, I don't need it. All right, well, the font colors. That's not quite black, so I wanna see what color this is. Well, zoom in, I guess. So I can find it, that is definitely not red. Is it red? Zoom in some more so I can see it. Okay. There. Zero, zero, zero. What is that? Get this back to 100%. Let's go over here. And the color is this. I'm gonna go ahead. I'm curious. I don't know what color it is. Oh, it's just slightly gray. Okay. All right. Well, that's about it for right now. So we have this all set up and ready to go. In the next video, we'll start filling this in. Now we're going to start filling in the navigation. So first I see that everything is aligned and it's centered in the middle. And when I collapse it, it all stays in the middle like that. So that means it's using a, another container within this bar container that's keeping it centered. So that's easy to do. Let's just create a container. Let's call it fixed width. We're going to set this. Let's see what the width is. Let's go from here all the way to the end. Let's say about, uh, let's put a thousand. A thousand so I can round, round up. It's a nice number. And then we're going to center it. So you remember how to do that? Margin equals zero auto. So I'm gonna go ahead and put some comments on here too for you guys. So, so centers in the middle. Definitely don't want an eight. There you go. I'm gonna go ahead and save this. Okay, so we're going to use this div the fixed width. And then we're going to put all the navigation stuff within that. So I'm going to clean this up, change this to fixed width. And now we're going to start putting things in here. Let's work from left to right. So let's do the logo first. Just to have all my classes up here, I'm going to put my IDs down here. So we're going to have the logo, which is going to be div ID is logo. And I can use an ID because it's only going to be one logo, this page. I'm going to make this news, I'm going to make that a font and not an image or SVG. So it's okay to use this logo. So what we're going to do is we're going to inspect this element since it's an image. I'm just going to copy the URL and there it is. So now we're going to style it. First, we're going to float it left once I actually create the ID. So we're going to float it left. Which is already floated left. Remember it's inside of the the fixed width container. And now Let's get it off of the top. So let's add padding to the top to six pixels. There you go. Wow, that's, that's perfect center. Wow, that's a good guess. <laughs> okay. Now let's see. It has a border there here on the side. So first, let's see. Zoomed in on the wrong thing. So let's zoom in on the border and see what color this is. Gray, oh, come back, come back, come back to me. There we go. Okay. Now let's put the border right, one pixel, solid, and then that number. Okay, it's squished. So that means we're going to add some more padding. So padding to the right. Let's do 10 pixels. You see? 
That's about right. Okay. Now we have this little problem with the border not coming down, so we're going to fix that. Adding some padding on the bottom. Just 7 pixels. Let's do that. Is that enough? Actually, it's a little too much. Let's go back to 100%. A little too much, I said, so 6. There, that's good. Alright, so that should do it for the, uh, the logo. Let's go to the next one. So, what's next? This little sign-in thing is next. Let's do that. I'll create a class. Sign in. Oh, I mean an ID, excuse me. ID. Div ID equals sign in. All right. So it says sign in. So first I'm, but first I'm going to get this nifty little thing. What is that? An eyeball? Is it like a robot eyeball? They're watching you. It's the news. There it is. Now what I'm going to do now. I'm going to first get rid of this ID because I don't need it. And let's add the sign in to it as well because I want them to be in the same part. Okay. So now we need some padding. And this also needs to be, the font needs to be different. But let's do the padding first. Actually, no, it'd be good to do the font first because I don't want to have to redo the padding. So let's do the font weight. Let's just make it bold, see how that looks. That's kind of right. Let's increase let's increase the font size. That's way too big. Too big. There. That's good. Okay. And also, don't want to forget that because I'm going to put more elements to the right, I'm going to float this left. So do that first before I forget, and then wonder why my elements are not in a line. So padding now. We want to bring it down, so let's put 10 pixels. Wow, I wasn't expecting that to work so nicely, but it did. Very good, very good. So now let's just add the border. I just love it when you just have to do one thing and not have to, you know, experiment a thousand times. So, well, not a thousand, but, you know, it's always nice. I appreciate a good moments. So let me find this border. What was the same? That's the, it's the same border color. Okay. Does that look the same? Yeah, it's the same. All right. Let's go to the unordered list now. So I'm going to create... Let's see. So this div is the sign in div. This other div goes to the fixed width. So I'm already confused on what this is, so I'm going to create a comment for it. I'm going to go ahead and save this. It's always good to save. If I had GitHub, I'd commit all the time. As much as I'm saving, I would make a commit. Let's make our unordered list. And let's see how many elements we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven elements. So, two, three, four, five, six, seven. New sport weather shop. News sport weather shop. Question mark shop. No, it's just fat fingers. Earth travel more. Earth. Travel more. Okay, so let's start styling this. So where is my, let's see, what? Which one is this? This is my top bar. So top bar, top bar. L. I'm going to also style top bar, ULLI. Let's go ahead and get rid of the list style. 
see what it looks like. And then we're going to, let's see, what do I want to do next? Get them in line by floating them, float, float left. There we go. I'm going to remain consistent. I'm going to put my float first. Okay, now uh, I'm going to go ahead and add those borders. So border right. Let's see, one pixel solid. And let's go find that color. It's the wrong way. It's down here. So here it is. B4, 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 there we go. The next time I'll remember. So let's see, where were we? We were on the LI. There we go. Now I want this to, let's see, is it the same? It's the same size as our little sign-in. Let's go ahead and take, is it bold too? I guess it is. Let's go ahead and take that. I'm going to add it up above. Okay, very good. Let's go ahead and this is kind of off. It's not in line at all. So let's give it some padding. Let's see if we get lucky again. Oh, actually, it's not really luck because I'm just using the same padding that worked down here. <laughs> so that's perfect, perfect. Let's check it. So it actually looks like my sign-in needs some padding to the right. So let's see, padding to the right, let's do 20 pixels. Definitely not enough, let's do 50. Actually, you know what I can do? I'm just gonna measure this. This would be a lot better. It's about 88, so let's go, let's just do 80. That's good enough. Let's go ahead and measure these other ones too. You know Photoshop, you can definitely use you know the same cutting and slicing and measuring as this. So I'm gonna go 60, 60 up here. And this is LI 60, so we have the top is 10, and I went 60, so 30 on the right, also 30. On the left and that's not working out very well let's see what this looks like when I make it a full page okay so that's not gonna work is this also because I have hold on I think I'm zoomed in and that's the problem if I'm zoomed in okay so measurements are off let's redo this 170 Oh, I'm not measuring. There we go. 85. What did I have to sit to? Oh, okay. That should, still should work. Now let's just take this down a little bit. And I don't think this is going to matter. Oh, it does matter. Okay. But I just have too much padding on the other ones. So let's just take it down a notch. That's good, as long as it looks proportional. Because we also have to add something else over here first. So the unordered list container here has some preset margin and padding that's pushing this down. So let's go ahead and fix that. Margin zero, oh, perfect. Let's go ahead and just set the padding to zero as well. Good. Now, the only thing that's left at the top is, let's put that search form in there. So that can be the next thing. And we'll just have a div or div ID actually of search box. Let's go down to our IDs. Make another ID. Search box. So we want this little 
icon in here inside of the search box. So what we're going to do is create the input, input type equals text, and the placeholder equals search, close it. And now let's fix this. Let's look to see how wide it is, about 200 pixels. Gonna work. Let's do 100. You can always go back and fix all this later. I just want it on the same line. But if, the reason why it's not on the same line is because I'm not floating it. I need to float it left. There. So now let's see how much did I say? 200. Let's try it. Well, let's put some padding on it first. See if I can push it out. And uh, 10 is the magic number, <laughs> because that's just what we've been working with. So if 10 works for the other ones, it's going to work for this one as well. And now let's add that, let's add the, the little icon thing to it. So what we're going to do is, since that's an input, we're going to go to search box input. And we're going to set that to background image. And then URL. And I have the URL saved to imager. So I'm going to pull that up real quick. Actually, for this one, let's see. I think the URL is available. Oh, yeah, this one it is. So let's copy the URL. I just want the URL. Just want the URL. Okay. I'll just cut it out. It's going to give me everything. So I'm going to cut everything out. Keep the URL. Search. Here we go. Okay. Close it. And let's see. It's not showing up because I haven't positioned it. So first, let's do background. Repeat, no repeat. Now let's actually position it. So background position equals right center. So there's an error here. And I can tell because this is not the right color. This should be purple. So, oh, here it is. I don't have the same tags. I mean, quotes. Okay, and there it is. And now let us add some padding. So 10 pixels have been the magic number so far. Not the magic number in this case. So I don't want to make it any bigger on the bottom. So let's not put it bigger on the bottom. I want it bigger on top though. It's just going to push it down. Actually, instead of doing this, let's use height. Let's just change the height. There, yeah, that's better. Now we can add some padding to make it, let's see, how does it, it's just in the middle. So, well, where did it go? Let's just put some padding on the bottom. Like one pixel, two pixels, next three, four pixels, five pixels. Yeah, that's good. Actually, no, it's not, because now it's pushed the thing down. So let's go back to two. There. Now yeah, that's good. I'm going to save it. On to the news bar now. So let's create another fixed width div. We have everything line up just how it should. Now let's add the news in there. We're going to have that in a paragraph. We can see the paragraph container has messed this up. It's added some unwanted margin padding. So let's go ahead and fix that. There we go. Okay. 
Now let's go ahead and style the news how we want it to be. So let's increase the size. 2M. It's going to be pretty big. We can make it a little bit bigger. First I want to see what font this is. Well, again, this isn't a font. This is an SVG. But it looks kind of like Arial. So let's just make it Arial. See what that looks like. Yeah, that looks pretty close. We seem to make it a little bit bigger. Is that about right? Maybe a little bit bigger. That's good. Alright, so on to the next one. On to the category bar. Let's do it. Before we do this, so I want to fix this news. Because it looks like it's not in line all the way. Let's go here. Make it position relative. Put it two pixels. There, now it looks like it's in line. Very good. I'll save. Now the category bar. I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to create a fixed width div. We're going to create an ordered list, just like we did for the first navigation. Now create the list items. Let's see, see how many we have. First, I want to fix this real quick. So let's find the category bar and category bar ul zero padding zero. Let's go ahead and create this as well. The category bar, selecting the list items because we're going to use that. Now let's see how many items we have. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. 12 items. So I'm just going to pause the video here so I don't waste time watching me do this. Okay, we're back. So first, let's get rid of the list style. That has those little bullets. List style, none. Now let's get all these list items in a row. Floating at left. Now, how about we get some padding on there? But first, after I do that, I want to get the font family and the font size down, right? So first, let's do the font. So let's do font family. Let's see what it looks like. It looks kind of the same as news. So I'm just going to call it Arial as well. Because it looks... That looks like Arial. Let's see the font. Actually, it already might have the correct size. Actually, it could be a little smaller. So let's just do it 0.8 m's. Might be a little bit too small. Let's do. Let's do 0.9. Yeah, that's better. All right. So next step is get some padding on there. But to help us get the padding, first let's add the border. That'll help us see where our padding is. And well, definitely don't want to leave it as white. So let's get this color. Okay, we need to make this border right, not all of it. Now it's time for some padding. Let's go with padding 10. Okay, so we need to bring it up a little bit. So 10. Actually, that's a little too much on top, so let's just do three pixels on top and three on bottom, ten on the side, see what that looks like. Looks like the border is not far enough down, so let's go to the bottom here and we'll add, actually the bottom is right there, so seven. Could use a little bit more. Eight, nine, that's good. All right, got that done, but now we need to align this to the rest of these elements and also bring it down a little bit. So let's go ahead and position that. Position is relative. Let's go right 10 pixels. Looks good. So then let's go down 2 pixels. That's perfect. Perfect. Now let's do the location bar which is this little white bar down here. So again, create the fixed width. 
div. And inside, we're going to have an ordered list again. And let's see how many elements we have. One, two, three, four, five, six. So I'm going to pause this again so I don't waste your time typing these out. Back. It's not showing up because I have the color is white. Change that to black. Now let's go ahead and create the lotion bar. Lotion bar? Location bar. <laughs> the unordered list. And then the list items. Let's select those. Lotion. Silly me. Okay. So we know the float these left. Put them in the line. List style is none. Now let's again zero out the margins. The padding. I'm going to let's just do this in order. What did I do here? Font family, then font size. Font family is going to be the same. Right? Yep, they look the same. And the font size about the same, maybe a little bit bigger. So it's probably 1M, so I'm just going to leave it alone. So the next step is padding. That might work, so let's just leave that. Add the border right. One pixel solid. Let's see, what color do we have? Grayish. This looks like the same color as up there, so if memory serves, it's all zeros. That's black. So let's see what color we have up here at the very top. Okay. Memory does not serve. I even said I would remember B4, 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 and I didn't remember it. Oh well, it happens. Okay. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to, let's see, this one's bold. So I'm going to make this bold. I'm going to create a class at the top. Where is it? Here we go. Bold. Not wait. It's bold. I'm going to give it this. Let's also, let's see, this might be a selecting uh, selection problem. Cut. This might be a selection problem, but find out. Nope, it worked. I wasn't sure if this class would override the selector, but a class is more specific than selecting the list item, so of course it works. So let's go back down here to the list item, and we're going to position these to make this fit over there. First I'm going to look at the padding. These are a little too big, so I'm going to have to make the font size smaller. way too small. As long as it's smaller than the above. So what did I have above? 0.9? So we have 0.8. That works. We go back and fix this. The 0.8. See that's weird that that just happened. So I might have to create an ID for this. So let's just make this an ID then. And now it has to it has to do what I say. And that's a little too big. That's way too big. Be a little bit bigger. There we go. Alright, let's go back down and let's position this stuff correctly. This category bar we need. Location bar or lotion bar. Ha 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 ha. All right. So relative, and we're going to push it right five pixels. A little bit more. 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 That's good. I'm gonna look at 
this. So the borders are off. Borders off, so that means padding needs to be fixed. So the padding on the sides is about right. It could use actually a little bit more padding, and we're just going to put 0, 12. So let's see here. That is, oh, okay. So this is going to take some finagling. So let's fix this padding here to make it look correct. Here we can see that the padding is in between and it's also in the middle. So let's go back here. And the reason why this isn't working right now is because the paddings are wrong. So let's go ahead and make this a more clear example and remove just the border right and we'll add the borders. So here we can see we have too much padding on top that's causing this. So let's just take that padding off, give it a padding of zero, see what that looks like. There we go, that's much better. We already have a padding of zero on the bottom, so that's good. Let's go ahead and put this back border right. Now let's see what it looks like here. Let's see if I need any more padding on the left or the right. That looks about right. So now what we're going to do is we're going to align this with the rest of them. So I need to increase this. So let's go 20. Use a little bit more. 25. 225. No, sir. Okay, we can use a little bit more. And that's about right. Okay, good. Now we can move on to the content section. We're almost done. So let's do the content section now. Scroll down to content. You know the drill. Div class equals fixed width. No question marks. Then we're going to add all of this good stuff here. So first we have an H1. And it says no Trident debate at labor conference. No Trident debate labor. Close the H1. Now we're going to go down and style it. Change the color at least because it looked like it was gray. So we have content H1. Let's take a look. Oh, I guess I don't need to do that. All right, let's find what color it is. All right, got the color. Perfect. All right, so let's add paragraph. And so I don't have to waste time typing this out. I'm just going to pause. All right, now we have our paragraph. Now we need to add the image. I have the image saved in Imager, and I'll post links to these images in the download section. So I'm just going to paste it here. And then we need some, I'm gonna use these links. So again, I'm gonna pause the video so I don't waste time. All right, there you have it. So first things first, let's float this image to the right. Let's go back and find our content. Here we go. Now this content section is limited. So let's measure this. It's about 215 pixels. So let's fix that. All right, the links are a little bit longer. Stop. <laughs> All right, 230 pixels. I'm gonna create an ID for those links. So content links, we're going to give them a separate width of 250. Give this ID to this. Content links. Now we're also 
going to get rid of that underline because there's no underline under those links. Content A equals text decoration. None. And there you go, it's gone. Now all we need to do is move this image over. Let's go back up to the image and we're going to position it relative. Let's move it from the right. 300 pixels. Uh, let's see. A little bit more. Too much. There we go. It's pretty good. There is some space under this, so let's measure this. It's a height of about 68. So let's go to links and give it a margin top of 68 pixels. Looks about right. Let's also change the line height because it looks like it's a little off. Probably 1.5, maybe a little bit more. Now we can compensate for this by taking the margin up a little bit. There, that's pretty good. For the last part, let's create the Swatch Listen Media sidebar. So that's going to be outside of our content. So let's create a new class called Watch Listen. And this won't be a fixed width because I want to position it over here on the side. So now we're going to have an H2 called Watch Listen. Remember, because you can only have one H1 per page. And then I took a screenshot of this image and I'll post it, a link to it in the resources page for you to use. So I'm going to get that real quick. And here we have the Watch Listen and the radio button. The next step is to create class for the watch listen section. And we're going to float it right. And we're also going to position it relative. We're going to bring it up to the bottom 300. We're going to move it from the right, just 300 for now. Okay, now I want to style the H2 so I know how I need to position this even better. So first, let's change, let's change the font family first. Arial, let's take a look. Okay, so the font size is less than the H1. It's less than the news header, but it's more than the, the navigation. The font weight is also thinner than what I have here, so let's change the font weight. To make it thinner, let's change it to 100. Okay. So this size is pretty good. Since I have this where I want it, let's go back to watch, listen, and create that border. Because I'm going to need a border on the left. The border left equals one pixel solid. And it's the same color as we use here. Which, now I remember, it's B4, B4, B4. There we go. Now we need some padding. Let's put the padding on the right. I'm not sure if I'll need any other padding, so I'm going to do it this way. There we go. And this is creating some unwanted margin, the H2 is. See if we, I can show you, delete the border left, and we'll see that there's some margins on top coming from this H2. So let's set the margin to zero and the padding to zero. There we go, fixed it pretty nice. Let's change the spec to border left. That's good. Now let's create some padding underneath this though, because I want to separate that. And actually I would use margin. So zero, let's put 10 pixels, zero. Let's see, could use a little bit more. Let's try 20. There we go. Now I want to position the image to be right underneath it. So let's select the image. And we'll say position relative. And we'll take it to the left. So let's say 10 pixels. Too much. 
Not enough. Not enough. There we go. Okay. Pause. Cut. The only thing that's left is to position this with the H1. So we're going to go back to the watch listen section because I want it all to move up as a singular group. I will want to position the watch listen div and not just the header because I want the radio button to come up with it. So we're going to increase this by a couple, too much, a little too much. There we go, perfect. And that's all there is to that part. So let's keep going. I'm gonna fix up a little bit of things and then we're going to host this to GitHub. Congratulations, you completed the course project. Now there are some things that we can be nitpicky about that we can fix, like take these borders off the last elements, fix up the search bar a little bit more, but I don't want this course project to run on too long. So I'm leaving these small details to you for extra credit. And when you're done, I want you to post a link to your pin in the discussion section or post a link to your GitHub account where you're going to host this. I'm going to show you how to host it right now. So let's do it. Let's go to a GitHub. And if you don't have a GitHub account, you can sign up and get one for free. It's pretty easy. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new repo. I'm going to name it BBC, BBC Clone 2015. And I'm going to create the repo. All right, here you can see instructions on how to create a local repo and push it to this repo. Uh, you can use it by command line, which I'm going to do, or they have a GUI that you can download. So the next step is I'm going to create a folder on my desktop. I'm going to name it BBC Clone. And then I'm going to open Sublime Text. Get rid of these old ones. Come back to me. Okay. So now I'm going to take all of the HTML here. I'm going to paste it here. I'm going to save this in the BBC clone folder as index.html. Okay, now I'm going to create a new tab or open a new file. I'm going to select and copy all of the CSS. I'm going to save this in the same file as styles.css. I'm going to go back to the HTML. Got to declare the HTML doc type. We're going to declare this as an HTML5 document. Also going to create the head section and the body section. Let's go down to the end. I'm going to remember to close our tags as soon as we open them. Let's go back to the head. I'm going to create a title, a BBC clone. It's going to display in the tab at the top. Now we have to import our CSS. So link rel equals style sheet, telling it what we're importing. We're going to tell it what type. It's going to be text. CSS, then the actual link. The actual link is styles CSS because it's in the same folder. Save this. Now we're going to open HTML and Safari to make sure that everything works. So where's Safari? There we go, CSS and everything is good to go. Next step is to create a local repo, so open terminal. I'm going to CD into the desktop and CD into BBC clone. I'm going to create a, a repository, a local one, via these instructions. So first, get init. I'm going to add a readme. You don't have to add a readme if you don't want to. And well, looks like we're not going to add a readme, so whatever. Get commit. This is the first initial commit. So if we ever need to roll back to before we have any files, that's fine. So now what we have to do is we're going to connect this to our remote repo. So get remote add origin. 
You can always just copy and paste these commands as well, so I'm just going to do that. I'm just going to... Now get push you origin master. Okay, now let's try to push this. Uh, I think the problem is I forgot to commit. Get add added HTML CSS files. So now git push origin. Okay, there we go. Now we push. So I'm going to leave this in here just so you can learn from my mistake. It's better that way. So now when we go to our repo, we can see that our index HTML and CSS are there. So now the last step is to create the web page for this so we can actually see it. Create a branch called GH Pages. Add that. Now we're going to make GH Pages the default branch. The way we do that is we go to Settings, go to Branches, change this to GH Pages. Now we're going to go back to the BBC Clone. We're going to go to GH Pages. We have everything here. Now it's hosted. All we have to do is go to go to mbowen, my username, .github.io, then the name of the repo, which is BBC Clone 2015. And there you go. Your website is hosted. You can link to this in your resume. You can put it on Facebook. You can show anybody. Anybody on the internet can see this. So congratulations. You have completed this entire course. And now you have everything you need to become a paid front-end web developer. I just pat yourself on the back. That was a lot of work that we covered, and you've come so far. Just congratulations. I'm so proud of you. This is the last lecture, and then you have completed 100% of this course. Again, I want to congratulate you for coming this far and putting this investment into yourself. It's really going to pay off. Now... What I suggest for the next three to four weeks, do nothing but create websites and projects in HTML and CSS. The knowledge and information you have now needs to be put into practical use for your brain to associate in your memory. And then after three weeks to a month, then it becomes more valuable to take another course and keep learning. This is the learning process of programming in any skill really. Thank you for being a part of this course.